It's time for Twit this week at Tech. Wow, we have a great panel. This may be one of the best twits in a long time. I'm glad you're here. Greg Farrow joins us from PacketPushers.net. Ashley Esqueda from uh, CNET. And Devendra Hardawar from Engadget. And, man, we got down. We talked about end-stage capitalism, the safety net for data, Uber, flying cars, blimps, and submarines. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for this week in tech is provided by Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com. This is Twit. This week in tech, episode six hundred twelve, recorded Sunday, April thirtieth. 2017. Sky Pirates of Silicon Valley. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Bowl and Branch. For a good night's sleep, try their ultra soft 100% organic cotton sheet sets. Get $50 off your first set of Bowl and Branch sheets and free shipping by visiting bowlandbranch.com. Enter the offer code TWIT. And by Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring? With ziprecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to BlueApron.com slash twit. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they want you to try their shave set free. Just pay shipping. Start your free trial today at harrys.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news. And we're going to have fun today because some of my favorite people are on Devinder Hardwar as your senior editor at Engadget. Hello. Hi, Devendra. Howdy. How's tricks? How are you doing? It's going with fine over here. I love I'm busy your office. With the, uh, the Tribeca Film Festival. Yeah, this is my pile of books and other other gadgets. Is your office chair, which looks very uh, fancy, is it the same one as in Silicon Valley? I don't think so. No, this is the <laughs> IKEA one. If you look okay. in the wire cutter, this is the step down, like a two hundred dollar office chair. Uh, the one they really recommend is like eight hundred bucks. I'm not going to spend that. You know money. what I'm? Ashley Esqueda knows. Yes. Esqueta. Yes. Knows she's uh, she laughed in an in a, an unknowing way. Hi Ashley, good to see Hi. you. Hi, good to see you. Welcome. It's good to see everybody. Hello. Yeah, I'm thinking of that chair, and actually, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's his name has inherited it. It used to be the other guys. <laughs> I don't. It's know like there. the Iron Throne. It used to be Tablovsky's chair. Valley. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a this is a whole article on Forbes. Look at this one. This is a five thousand dollar. Oh, yeah, I've tried that out. I've tried that I've out. I've seen a picture of you in it. This looks like you could get dental work while you're uh, mm -hmm. playing. I'm uh, going to tell you, I did not enjoy this the uh, the sensation of having a chair lean backwards and recline while a, com a monitor was over my face. Because I know how I feel when I accidentally drop my phone on my face when I'm laying down and tired. So I <laughs> just the idea of that thing coming crashing down and slamming me in the face is... It's not great. I don't love it. I, and also, I don't want to work laying down. I, I want to take a nap when I'm laying down. <laughs> so Richard Hendricks got Action Jack Barker's uh, chair. It's kind of, uh, but apparently it's real. This is it's a real chair, man. Yeah. It's a real chair from Scandinavian Designs. And it's not that hey. expensive. It's only 499 bucks. It's called the Wow mm. Desk Chair. Wow. Oh, that's a bargain. Look at that. Yeah. I think, Devendra, you should run out and get it. I yeah. should. Wouldn't you look trade, good in that? Trade in. Look it's at amazing. the nice color yeah. scheme there. That's beautiful. It's interesting <laughs> to look at. I like it. And it's got a good name, the Wow. <laughs> hey, also with us, Greg Farrow from the Packet Pushers Network. Greg was giving us a lesson in how uh, internet infrastructure works in the uh, 21st century before the show. <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't hear it. He's at Ethereal Mind on uh, Twitter. Great to have you back. Thanks so much, uh, Leo. Sorry I couldn't get there today. Uh, and I just want to point out that I do have a chair, fancy chair, but I bought I couldn't I bought it secondhand. Oh, and it works out. What, kind do you go? what kind do you yeah. have? It's 
It's a, it's a Herman Miller Aeron. Oh, it's an Aeron. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, because, uh, that's uh, so 1999. Yeah, yeah, but I bought it secondhand. So uh, <laughs> eBay, back in the days yeah. when eBay was workable. <laughs> Find a startup that's going out of business and buy all their chairs. If that's, you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can have all of this for oh, pennies yeah, any, on the dollar. Any startup that goes out of business, yes. just show up. Just show, show up. up. They'll give it Let to you. Let me assure you that if I was in the Silicon Valley area, I couldn't afford to live there. Well, that's I right. Promise. There's there's uh, benefits. Your house in would, in fact, be that chair. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> literally it. Yeah, there'd be a, a meter of either side. That would be about all I could yeah. afford. Uh, I've right, looked into right. it several times, but I've never been able to. Uh, I just can't afford to live there. I, it's it's uh, way too expensive. Oh, but we love it here, don't we? Ashley, I forget. Yeah. Are you in the east? You're in L.A., I aren't you? I definitely am not in San Francisco. Yeah. I'm in L.A. Yeah. Mm. Where all the real TV people are. That's and, right. And Devinder's in New York. And uh, today, mm -hmm. uh, Greg's joining us from the U.K. Where in, where in England? Uh, Cheltenham, in the center, just near GCHQ. They're probably tuned <laughs> into us, right? Nice. <laughs> Yes. Nice. Good to have them. It's glad it's an international show today. It is all great. These great, uh, great location. I love that. Uh, that's thank you, Skype. So earn. This was the week of earnings. Amazon and Microsoft and uh, and Google via its Alphabet, and all three of them actually uh, did very well in the cloud. This was this was the quarter the cloud showed its strength. Um, both at Amazon. Now, Amazon, is, you can't really judge from uh, because Jeff Bezos has a big knob or a lever or something in his office that has profit on one side and, and <laughs> debit on the other. And he decides exactly <laughs> how much he wants to make in any given quarter. Total net income uh, up to $724 million. A million, a million with an M. Million. Nothing. Well. Nothing. <laughs> Um, but a lot of it from uh, cloud. M Microsoft's Azure cloud business grew 93% year over year, almost wow. doubled year over year. And that made a big difference in Microsoft's uh, bottom line. Uh, Google, which makes, of course, most of its money uh, in advertising and made a huge amount in advertising, still did pretty well with the cloud platform. They said in their uh, analyst call, Ruth Porat, their CFO, said, the fastest growing business, uh, one of the company's fastest growing businesses was uh, the Google Cloud Platform. Although really, Google, phew, you want to hear numbers. Google's ad revenue has doubled since 2012. Uh, in 2016, it had 32.8% of the total ad revenue. But that to that totaled, let me see if I find the number, just a massive profit uh, for Google. And big growth, I think tw almost 20% growth over uh, this year uh last that's quarter of this year so yeah big that's big big stuff. big business big big business well you know they got to make all that money so that they can uh so that you know larry page can make a lot of flying jet skis it's really uh yeah. it's really compelling you gotta to wonder to how much larry off. and sergey are really involved day to day right now sergey's like we yeah. got to make lots of money because i need an airship <laughs> he's building a I blimp a blimp <laughs> i need it and I, uh, we gotta just make that money. So why is it that why is it that rich middle aged men go to they fly their own planes or make their own plane? They've always got to get into flying, right? How many times do you wake up in the morning and read the news <laughs> and you know fifty five year old so and so was flying his plane from here to there and crashed it? It's flying it or it's family. yachts. Yes. And then if you're a yachtsman, there's a couple of no. things you do. I we worked for Paul Allen when we worked at Tech TV. Yeah. And very famously, he built a submarine in his yacht. <laughs> and so there's a, apparently there's companies that make submarines for rich people. I don't mean like little submersibles. I mean submarines. And, and, and. How else are they going to play Battleship, Leo? How else? <laughs> so. <laughs> yachts, so yachts are for billionaires. Yeah. Millionaires yeah. play with planes, right? There's, there's, yeah. You've got to get it right, right? If you go down onto the French Riviera or down onto the Greek down in the Greek islands, you can see all the yachts pulled up. And that some of them have not just the submarine, but two tenders, so two little boats as well. So that if they come into the harbour and they want to go to the other side of the harbour, they get in the boat and drive across the harbour. They don't walk around or catch a taxi. They get a, a special boat put out over the side. I'm I mean, just waiting for the flying boats. Like, that's the logical <laughs> Flying boats, yeah. Right. Where's, where's the, my yeah. flying pontoon uh, jet ski? That's, I mean... The, funny, the funniest thing was we were told that Paul Allen built his boat with a submarine in the belly... Because he didn't like to jump when he scuba dived. He didn't like to jump in the water. Aww. He, li <laughs> he liked to emerge into the water. Oh. So 
Gotta have make it so. <laughs> make it so. No words. Yeah. It's, you I know mean, what? I, look, if I was a Silicon Valley billionaire along uh, in the vein of a Bill Gates or a Jeff Bezos, I mean, look, the rocket stuff I get. Like, let's all go to space. But also, I'd be putting so much money into having robot servants, like humanoid <laughs> robots. That's that's the thing I want. That's the sign of true wealth is to have little robot servants that look just like you. You make like a little bunch of robot clones walking around your house like, hello, Ashley. So nice to see you today. Oh, hi, Ashley. Thank you. I Thank you. I do look fabulous. Like, <laughs> yes, that's what I want. Here's an article. It's a little dated. It's from a couple of years back. The world's most expensive luxury submarines. And the best one here at the bottom is called the Phoenix. It's an only $80 million, 10 bedrooms, a gymnasium, wine cellar, jacuzzi, operates at 1,000 feet, 213 feet long, 5,000. Is company still in business? Yeah, that doesn't really exist. That, that's they a only render. need to sell one. They're like, look, guys, yeah. we just got to sell one. That's all we got to do. Well, how about the Seattle? It's a hundred. It's a render. It's a, it's, yeah. They're renders. Well, because how many because people? Because no one's ever ordered one. You yeah. think? Mm. Mm. I, these things don't they exist. They might give build. You know that's what, guys? real. Because, yeah, because they're go. submarines and we've never seen them. This one is Paul Allen. Under the radar. And he built it to look like the Beatles' yellow submarine. Wow. Of course. It can stay I mean, underwater for a week. It's good. not as big. It's only 40 feet. He also oh. owns a $200 million yacht called Octopus, which has two helicopters, seven boats, a crew of 60, and costs $384,000 a week to keep wow. running. But I love it that he built his submarine as a yellow submarine. I think that's, Paul likes rock and roll, right? Of if course. you're going to do it, I mean, yeah, that's what you would do. Right? Man. Be hard not to sing. We all live in, when you get in there. I bet you the crew, he pays them to sing that every time he gets yeah, in there. Yeah, in the yellow. Well, he, you know, he doesn't have to pay them to sing it because he has a recording studio down there oh, as well. Yeah. With a full-time engineer because he wants to, anytime he wants to go down there, he wants to be able to play. Great acoustic shielding in a submarine. Device. Sure. So, so, but more to the point, Sergey Brin is building a. This article came out uh, this week. A uh, a blimp. We, you know, he they rent the uh, old NASA Ames uh, blimp dirigible. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Hangers. Hangers. Yeah. Uh, which they were created, uh, you know, in during uh, World War Two to to house dirigibles until the Hindenburg, Hindenburg kind of put the kibosh on the whole thing. But um, that was terrible. Yeah, but 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 of course that was pre World War II, but that was because it ha it was it was it was lighter than air, made out of hydrogen, which, as everyone knows, is kind of explosive, slightly but flammable. slightly flammable. Uh, but you put helium in these things, you don't you know make you talk funny, but it doesn't explode. Uh, he, apparently, well, the Germans the Germans used hi uh, hydrogen because that was the only gas they couldn't, they couldn't get, get helium. Of. Yeah. Well, uh, but the Americans always used higher helium right. because they have a naturally occurring source in... Um... Now, Silicon Valley has been talking about Oh, I'm about sorry. Developing some, some nice Bloomberg ladies talking. Never mind. <laughs> so this is the hangar, although that blimp is not Sergei's blimp. That's This is 1934 when uh, blimps were big. Um, and that hangar, though, still stands. And so he could build it in there. I've often wondered. He bought, you know, he rented the uh, <laughs> the hangars. Why not? <laughs> Yeah, you know, why not? Why That's, not? I'm a big fan of that. Why not? I mean, he's got if if it's you know if it's not coming out of the pockets of you know it's obviously coming out of our pockets in some way, but you know if I give up a little of my privacy so that Sergey can fly around in a blimp, I guess that's all right. It's pretty clear he hasn't yet taken it out for a spin because we would know. We would see, yeah. I mean, if, unless it's oh unless my it's god, Leo, what if it's an invisible blimp? Oh yes, my exactly. god! I go. text. <laughs> <laughs> this is a race to whichever billionaire can build the first airship, like that they can just yeah, live on. A true airship like yeah. Bowser and Super Mario yeah. Brothers. I mean, like, seriously, it's just <laughs> propellers. They're all inside. It's made of wood. It's amazing. There's like cannons and stuff. The Sky Pirates. The Sky Pirates Sky of Silicon Pirates. Valley. That's the yeah. next. That's next gen. So so Google Glass has become those steampunk goggles that you used to have. Remember oh, the steampunk 100%, goggles? Yeah. 100%. They're 100%, AR yeah. goggles. I love it. Yeah. I love yeah. all of yeah. You know, I'm going to go. Yeah, I got to go, guys. I got to go write this movie. Right Actually, now. <laughs> itself, that yeah. might solve the whole dorky glasses thing. Make them look <laughs> steampunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steampunk still looks dorky. Yeah, Just but it's dorky in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I would wear steampunk goggles. I'd do it. You could do it. at least you could sell steampunk. You definitely couldn't sell Google Glass. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I love this uh, this story. I'm going to jump all over today because you guys are you guys are playful, so we can have some fun. Uh, the Dark Overlord, the Dark Overlord, has apparently hacked the production company that had Orange Is the New Black and a bunch of shows from ABC, Fox, National Geographic, and IFC, and they tried to blackmail Netflix. They said we have. The next season of Orange is the New Black, which comes out in June, uh, they, and if you don't pay us, we're going to put it on the torrents. Well, Netflix just laughed at them, so they put it on the torrents on yesterday. Netflix was like, <laughs> Netflix like, we make deal. house of cards, dum dum. We yeah. know how blackmail works. Well, you can't do this. Uh, yeah, right. Orange is the New Black, according to Netflix, is their most popular uh, Netflix original. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Very popular. Huh. They're, very, great they're, very, uh, they're very cagey about giving out numbers for each of their individual shows. Mm -hmm. So that is um, that is actually mm -hmm. a, a real key piece of information for the industry. According This is yeah. according to Variety. Um, the, the studio is a, a ADR, which is what? Something dialogue recording. Additional dialogue recording. Larson Studios. They got mm -hmm. hacked in the fall. The, oh. and uh, but the the hacker doesn't have the whole season just at the first 10 episodes <laughs> so Netflix is going yeah go that's great it's a great promo you still have to subscribe to Netflix to find out what happens oh well, you're not gonna get that season finale you gotta subscribe yeah. find out these yeah. hackers have really good taste because uh, I feel like Orange is the New Black doesn't get as much uh, talk or as much as like House of Cards or something yeah so. no you're it's really right good. it's like it's less, that's, this is a good hype man it's, it's a, a great a series I bet I you it's an inside job it. What a great marketing campaign by Netflix. So now you're telling me that Dark Overlord is actually a Netflix employee trying to beat up? Uh, well, first I mean, of it's all. Reed, it's obviously first of Reed all. Hastings, guys. It's obviously Reed Hastings, what? the Dark Overlord. He yeah. probably calls himself that in uh, executive meetings. What kind of <laughs> what kind of hacker names himself the Dark Overlord? I mean, <laughs> a very young one. This very, is four, this is a 14-year-old. Definitely. <laughs> definitely a kid. And it and by the this way, is a kid of somebody who works at that ADR house, right? Yeah. Like that's that's what we're all it's guessing. Is dopey. that it's gonna something like that? Yeah. His Twitter uh, handle has a three in it for the in the word hacker. Oh, so that's leet. He's that's leet. Leet. So you know he's really. <laughs> anyway, he's the deadline passed. He posted it, and then he did a press release. He called it a press a release. Press release. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> he called it a press. It's so cute. He's so adorable. Yeah. He called. Uh, let's uh, let's go to the Dark Overlord hacker. Uh, now this isn't it. Uh, I'm trying to find. There's apparently many Dark Overlords on Twitter. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he needed. Uh, he didn't was like the Dark Overlord 46. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> oh, this is terrible. Anyway, I'm trying to find the uh, Dark Overlord press release because it's the funniest thing I ever read. Um. Let me see if I like can find it somewhere. Can you find it, Karsten? Because he he he's he's kind of is it is it the one where he says it didn't have to be this way? It didn't that, have to be one? this way. That was my favorite. He says uh, he says it didn't have to be this way. Netflix. Wait, can I can I just make? Would you do, be okay. Dark Overlord for us, Ashley? Esqueta? I'll be Dark Overlord, guys. I'll All be right. Dark Overlord. It didn't have to be this way, Netflix. <laughs> You're going to lose a lot of money in all of this than what our modest offer was. We're quite ashamed to breathe the same air as you. Wait a minute, what? We're quite ashamed to breathe the same air as you? So ashamed. <laughs> we figured a pragmatic business such as yourself would see and understand the benefits of cooperating with a reasonable and merciful entity like ourselves. Merciful. <laughs> we are the merciful dark overlord. Yeah. And I really love the end where he says, and to the others. There's still time to save yourselves. Our <laughs> offers are still on the table for now. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll tell you what, if it, if uh, it, you know that if I ever do something like this, I am going to be the dark overlord so that attribution just becomes a disaster. Like, if you're going to do this, you do not want people tracking you down. You do not want no. – this is a really good way to obfuscate people tracking you down because they're going to go like – like hitting Netflix is going to be like bad news bears. They can come after you, right? There's some smart yeah. people at Netflix. But I'm your dark overlord. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Don't mess with me. That's right. I'm going to get my braces <laughs> off in six months and then you'll be sorry. <laughs> But please don't arrest me before prom, guys. <laughs> Didn't we These see this person have... on social media? The person with the raven on the subway? Pretty sure that's dark overlord. <laughs> I think you're right. The person with the right. live raven. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do oh I boy. need to get my hoodie and put my hoodie on like Mr. Robot? <laughs> yeah. Even Mr. Robot didn't call himself the Dark Overlord. Come on, kid. Come on. Get a, come on handle. Get a good handle. Get a good handle. Come on.
Dark Overlord. I love that. That's so different. You know, I'll tell you right now, like, if I could give you some advice, Dark Overlord, if you're watching, uh, do not hack <laughs> HBO. Because if you take Game of Thrones, they will they will literally hire Liam Neeson to find you. Right. Like, it will very be the plot of Taken, skills. the next Taken movie. It will yeah. be very serious. Yeah. Here's the, I found the uh, Dark Overlord, who's apparently a Vincent Van Gogh fan. Oh, uh, big time. He says, yeah. And he, and, uh, uh, There's no copyright on Vincent Van Gogh. Oh, oh he's very. He's, he doesn't want to. Yeah, doesn't want to offend. Sorry. Offend. Open yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, would, amazing. He wouldn't have to. <laughs> Ashley, you do that voice very well. <laughs> you will get to play the Dark Overlord when we make the oh, movie. Oh my God! In the yeah. in the motion picture, the in Pirates the of Silicon Valley, the Dark I'm Overlord could be the villain in that I'm movie. It'll be great. You. Awesome. Mm. Awesome. Let's take a break. We're going to have fun today. We are having fun today. Ashley, is, I'm trying to work on your name. I'm sorry, Esketha. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Ashley Esketha from CNET is here. Great to have you. You're still from CNET, right? Yes. Okay. We don't have it in your lower third, but we'll fix that. Unless you don't want no, us to. No, just come find me. Just come find me on Twitter. That's find I'm me like, on Twitter, she says. I on Twitter. It's the, it's the easiest, best way. And that's easy because it's A-S-H-L-E-Y-E-S-Q-E-D-A. Couldn't you get like T the Dark Overlord Esquet Esquet Esquet? I tried the Dark Overlord with a three, but it was already taken. <laughs> Follow her on Twitter, everybody. Also, Devinder Hardwar from Engadget. We're gonna get him Hello. that chair. I'm sending you that chair. <laughs> I love it. I love the colors because this one's just it's all black. It's yeah, no right. tan. You got tan. Tan's the new color. And uh, Greg Farrell from the Packet Pushers Network. Great to have all three of you. Your packet pushers. The real dark now. overlord. He is actually. <laughs> yeah, that he is true. You know what? You overlord. probably he probably is actually. Please you know, register for a true dark overlord on Twitter. Here <laughs> laughing at us, <laughs> saying, "You're next, Laporte. I'm going to release this entire year's episodes of Twit <laughs> in advance. In advance, <laughs> and which would be great because I just go home. <laughs> Please be my like, guest. All right. Please, dark overlord. I'll give you. I'll give you the FTP site. Just download them all. <laughs> <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Sheets, of all things, the best bedding in the world. You know, having a good night's sleep, we're, we're learning actually is a huge part of health, sleeping well. And uh, it, it's one thing to have a great bed. And I know a lot of you have your Casper mattresses, but you've got to also put great sheets on those beds. And Bowl and Branch is the place to go. You will fall asleep faster. You will sleep deeper. You'll wake up ready to tackle your day. I sleep on Bolin Branch sheets, and I love them. 100% organic cotton. They start soft. You know, sometimes you'll buy sheets. I, I bought a pair of sheets, and I regret it. They're very, very expensive sheets. I had to wash them eight or nine times before I could sleep on them because they were like, they had a lot of starch or something. I don't know. They were crispy. These start soft, and over time, they get softer, and you just feel like you're just living on a cloud. And by the way, Bolin Branch sells online only, so you don't pay the department store markups. Which is huge, which is like 100%. You're getting half price for twice the quality. Bowling Branch bedding is slept on by three former U.S. presidents, countless celebrities. The reviews rave. I'm raving about it, and I want you to feel good about your sheets inside and out. They're ethically made. Every aspect of the company is geared toward making the world a better place and making your sleep better. Try them for 30 nights and see for yourself. If you're not impressed, just return them for a full refund. And by the way, for gifts... If you've got a wedding or a baby shower or a housewarming gift, the box they come in is beautiful. Heavy cardboard with these satin ribbons. It's You don't have to wrap it. It's it, In fact, when I got my sh sheets the first time, I thought, wow, what did somebody send me a gift? No, it's just my bowl and branch sheets. You'll love it. Order them from home, free shipping, free returns, and about half the cost. Go to B-O-L-L, -L, like, you know, the cotton bowl, B-O-L-L -L and branch today, bowlandbranch.com. $50 off your first set of sheets, plus free shipping if you use the promo code TWIT. So try them and uh, gift them. B-O-L-L, -L, bowlandbranch.com, promo code TWIT. The best sheets you've ever slept on. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be hooked. You'll be hooked. <sighs> I love like, I feel so relaxed after I, talking about I, sheets. I, I'll take a nap. I like <laughs> your banner on your Twitter, Ashley. Oh, thank you. Those are your glasses. Now, do you have many pairs of these or just one? So, uh, funny story. I've had I've been accused many times of having fake hipster glasses. Like you, uh, like 
you you don't need them? Like, yeah, like I don't need them. Um, well, you can see the reflection here that I do have a prescription in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't need them to see close up. So technically right now I could take them off and be fine and, and read stuff online. Um, but uh, I need them to see far away. And I actually have three pairs of these glasses. I um, I bought the last two pairs that LA Eyeworks ever had. They discontinued wow. them last year and uh, they They're called me and cool. said, they called you. you. Them? They know it's and, your trademark. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I just I uh, this is my signature pair of glasses. And so I have other pairs. You can see them actually right back here. Yeah, But what are you going to do? Thing. Um, I, so I have uh, I have one pair that is a pristine pair that is no joke in a uh, storage uh, safety deposit <laughs> box at my bank. Are they insured? <laughs> uh, they're not insured. Uh, however, and then I also have a pair. And this is the thing that sort of gets people is they go, well, she's not wearing any lenses when you see some pictures of me and things. Right. I actually have a what I call a stunt pair that doesn't have <laughs> lenses in it for photo shoots right, and some other glare. appearances yeah, because of the glare. Of the glare. Yeah. So um, I have a stunt pair as well. I'm getting such an so education here, Leo. <laughs> well, I just say so, like. As somebody who spent 30 years being a nerd in enterprise <laughs> IT, this is all like, you know, magic. Yeah, this Greg's is, jealous because no one has ever said to Greg, you know, LA you just wear magic. Those are prop glasses, Greg. You don't need them, do you? Go ahead. Just <laughs> take God, them Greg, off. You're such a fake geek guy. Just such a Jeez. fake. Take, take them off. take them off and it's like, what? What? The computer. <laughs> Where? What? What? When we, so when, I, I look like that when I take them off when I'm driving. I'm like, I can't read anything. <laughs> Where I just I drive all the way to Florida. I just would not know how to get home. I can't read anything. I can't read street. Apparently, <laughs> this is Mr. enough Magoo. of an issue for You're Ashley. She actually has to put this in her Twitter bio. My glasses my are prescription. Like people uh, really rag you for that. They t they do. It's, it's crazy. a crazy thing. I don't know why, but I, I do terrible. need them, and I yeah. love them deeply. Twitter is um, terrible. Yeah, I think yeah. people also can't believe that I would choose these glasses for myself because a lot of people are afraid of a bright, bold pair of glasses. Um, but uh, I learned after trying these on for the first time, I I felt like Embrace I put it. on Superman's cape. Like I, yeah. I it was Embrace amazing. It. Like I'd always worn uh, black black glasses, and then I tried these on, and I loved them so much, and. Um, Someone told me at that store that I bought them from, uh, she said, your glasses should always match your insides. And I thought that that was really cool. And so um, so I kind of live by that now when I buy new glasses. I'm like, do they match how, like my fun personality, like they yeah. should match your personality, not your clothes every day. Well, I'm guessing that Ashley's going to be the first on her block to own the new Echo look. You're right, I am. <laughs> Which is, by the way, not an April Fool's joke, but the real deal. And I, by the way, you could see... I have already requested an invitation as well. This is right, uh, the newest Amazon Echo. It has. I bet you did you pre-order that jacket that girl's wearing? Too? Yeah, this I'm gonna. Yeah, one? yeah, great. I'm gonna get that jacket because that that is gonna look great on me. It's gonna you look know, amazing. It's kind of funny because they you I don't know we're watching the video and they show one guy, like well, he's at, very fashionable, obviously. Yeah, but he, they don't show him ever again. Like that's it. And then. <laughs> Because I don't, I don't think really this is a guy thing exactly. So the idea is it's an Amazon Echo, but it has a built-in camera with LED light, and it can shoot stills or video, and then send that information back to Amazon. For what, Ashley? What is it going to do to help me? Well, uh, they have a feature called Style Check, and so you can send two different outfits, uh, two pictures of two different outfits to Amazon. And they have. Uh, deep machine learning algorithm, no. and a computer algorithm, and and some actual, uh, supposedly fashion oriented human beings behind the uh, behind style check that will uh, compare and contrast your two outfits and then give you back sort of a uh, this one is sixty it's a, yeah sixty four percent this is the look you should go with. See if they had a human a stylist back there that would be that'd be cool. Boy yeah I mean but that, I think you, that that's sort of the point that Amazon wants to do at some point like you'll have. You, they do have human sort of stylists, but then they're sort of offsetting the cost of that, you know, human mm. by by using machine learning to sort of learn what you like to wear and what your style is. And then when you log into Amazon, of course, Amazon is going to recommend you all of the great clothes that right. it sells uh, so that you yeah. can buy it. And, and it knows your style and it knows what you like to wear. It has so a, a really standard uh, tripod socket. So... Greg, I know you have your iMac mounted on a hydraulic lift in your wall. You could, yep. I don't think Greg is really the market for this, but you could, <laughs> you, you could have this on an so arm. There's gonna be, there's gonna be a brown alert if you, if I always get one of those, and it just go. Why are you I'm wearing sorry. brown all the You're time? You're wearing too much tan. Stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, 
Uh, it has. My, my biggest concern is that like it's gonna look at me one day and and then and then I'll just log into Amazon and it almost like subtweeting me. It's going to like start recommending like workout clothes. Yeah, no, that would be <laughs> mean. It won't do that. And a no. juicer, like no. a juicero. Yeah. It'll be like, hey, uh, <laughs> it, hey, you were stupid enough. To, I mean, uh, smart enough to buy yeah, this. Yeah. Maybe you'll buy a seven four hundred dollar juicer. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's the thing I worry about. That's 200, the, oh, hey, here's this exercise bike just in case. Yeah. Two hundred dollars <laughs> uh, for this, which is uh, as much as the Echo used to cost. In fact, uh, the Echo was this started this way too with invitation uh, only, mm -hmm. uh, and it does everything an Echo does. It's just adding the camera onto the Echo. But of course, immediately the dystopian fantasies began. People started freaking out about privacy. Devendra, would would you mm -hmm. would you admit an Echo look into your house? I'm not sure. I have an Echo. I have a couple Echo Dots, actually. But this thing looks like um, what I love about the Echo is it's also a very good speaker. So I can like throw a Bluetooth. Yeah, this stuff doesn't over have there. speakers at all, it looks like. Yeah, I yeah, don't think so. It says you can so play music. Less, it does say you can play I music. I think it's more like a dot. Don't you think this but, is like yeah, a just dot? Just looking at the size yeah. of it, like the Echo's a big cylinder. So you could, that's a lot of space to have to build yeah, this, a speaker. This, this, this thing is tiny. Yeah, so I wouldn't buy this for me. Uh, maybe my wife would be into it, but she's also creeped out about like machines just, you know, getting into every aspect of our lives. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think I'll be buying this at all. This is not for the duct tape over the camera set. Uh, Definitely not. <laughs> this is you know who I, I like. Who I pegged this on was I actually think Amazon might have a hard time with this, if only because I think this product is perfect for Gen Z men and women. Who's Gen Z? I'm, I've lost track of the... Just about beyond millennials. So like the set that's like 12 to, to let's say 20 right They're now. They're teenagers like, right now. Teenagers coming into adulthood, like might be in high school. Um, but if it, it needed to be cheaper. So I, like, I feel like if it were $99 and maybe like, it, it feels like it's a little too expensive for the set that it mm -hmm. should be for, which is a, a generation of kids who are literally plugged in and sharing pictures of everything they do every second of every day. And, and maybe we don't understand that as much. Like I, I know that I don't use social media to share every bit of minutia of my day. But this like is for the YouTube does. haul video crowd, right? This is, yeah. Like it's this to me seems like beauty bloggers, style bloggers, uh, people who really watch those things. And fashion is a huge industry. It's a, it's a, I believe last year, a one of one study pegged it at a $2.4 trillion industry worldwide. So it's not small potatoes and Hi Amazon. Guys, today's video. Oh, is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got, I got, I, uh, I started. I got Lindsay's doing a haul. I'm sorry. Uh, let me turn off. Oh, you got to get that collective haul. Like, oh, oh boy. God. A big haul, big <laughs> haul. Wait. Free people but forever. Yeah, 21 Sephora. She went everywhere. This is going to be so awesome. This is <laughs> totally the history. audience for this, right? It's totally the audience for this. And it's to say like, oh, here's my lookbook for spring or whatever. It's like, the, you know, these beauty bloggers, they'll put together a lookbook. They'll set up a whole set so that their look can take pictures of them in a very specific place in their house or apartment. Mm -hmm. Like that is... To they're me, not, no, they're not. No, that crew, I disagree with that. That crew is not going to use the crappy camera in a two hundred buck um, piece of rubbish mm. that Amazon's going to flog to everybody. That's it's literally a way to sell more rubbish, right? Right. What Amazon needs um, is a bunch of data to feed the machine learning algorithms that it needs to do. So it's got a bunch of humans behind there, fashion consultants, whatever you like. Um, but it's never going to take pictures at a sufficient quality that the YouTube beauty vlogger crowd. Yeah, no, 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 no. But the wanna, that, but the, the wannabe, the wannabes, right, right? Right. Exactly. Yes. The the ones who go. The kids. I love. Uh, you know, Michelle fan and I love right. uh, Gigi Gorgeous right. and I want to put together my lookbook. Like that's a way for them to do that and share it with their friends and, and do these sort of little short videos and things like that of a, a 360. And like they don't have yet Instagram husbands to like take their photos for them <laughs> and stuff. And like that's literally exactly wait, who wait this minute, is for. I'm minute, telling wait you. Well, what, wait a minute. What, what's an Instagram husband? Have you ever seen Pretty that? Uh, it's a parody. <laughs> it's a par There's a great parody video on this where uh, it's Instagram husbands are these guys that like, you know, your significant other is really into Instagram and is like, help me get the perfect shot. And it's always the, he's the photographer. Oh. For, like, this, it's beautifully oh, curated. Instagram. Yeah. I might be an Instagram husband. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Here's, an, here's, the, here's the parody video. It's a great oh. little parody video. It yeah. makes every time I see it, it just, it's so perfect and well done. Like, there are a bunch of apps that do similar things too. So I think this is this camera is meant to replace some of those, like the people just yeah. taking a photo in front of a mirror. Right. Um, right. But I think that would be much more useful, and that would that sort of visual data data would be good for Amazon too. So yeah. Yeah, I'm not yes. sure 100%. who needs this hardware yet. Yeah. yeah. At this yeah. Point. Hey, keep in mind, 
So this is where Google YouTube has uh, Google has such an advantage over its competitors. Just to nerd out on this a little bit, is that YouTube is full of all this fashion data, and Google can go in with its uh, machine learning and its pseudo artificial intelligence and start mining the data sets that it's got from YouTube to start putting this data together. So if it decides that fashion is its thing, then it can just take that data and do that. Amazon's got to build a data set. So how do you get pictures of fashion? And in fact, this is going to build a very beautiful data set for training machine learning because you're going to get real people in fixed forms, like in the home, trying on different um, outfits mm -hmm. and colors and things. And you're going to be able to build the most comprehensive data set for feeding into the ML algorithms to get recommendation engine coming out the other side. It's a great way of exploiting. Same resolution, um, same size. Like it's so, e it'd be so easy to process. It's my new, yeah. I have a dot in every room. It's my closet echo. I need an echo in every room, including my walk-in closet. And that's exactly where it's going to be. Um, mm. I'm not going to, I mean, I don't know if I have I'd put it right <laughs> next to my front door so like I could do it right before I oh, walked out and be like, do I, I look yeah. good? Yeah. That's maybe what the, I want to do. And then also it's yeah. like maybe I could like take a picture as a kind of a pseudo security camera. Like someone walks in and take a picture of them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because there could be other slices on this. That's exactly right. Right. You could have it have, it could have skills later. I mean, any any Amazon Echo with a camera could be used for a variety of different skills. You know, Alexa, they did say we're going to expand the skills on this. And um, sorry to anybody who has a Echo at say home. Echo I'm triggering of, it. I'm say, sorry. Say Echo apologize. instead of the A word. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so um, there's this is a really interesting kind of move by Amazon. And it feels like, you know, and I know that uh, on CNET, we had a, a little bit of a scoop this week that was like, you know, maybe Amazon's working on a touchscreen version so interesting um, you know actually so. that there there's some uh, evidence that maybe there's going to be a market for that because microsoft when they announced that they were going to put cortana in a similar device said that part of the specs for such a device would be a touch screen Right. Yeah. I'm not sure Which why is weird you want because a touch it's like, screen. Why would you want a touch screen when you're controlling it with your voice? But yeah, yeah like, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, because yeah. it's to close the feedback. Once you control something with your voice, like when you work with Siri on your phone or uh, your uh, Echo, um, the feedback loop is really poor. You don't have any sense of when something goes wrong. There's mm -hmm. no way of saying to an Echo, you know, or mm -hmm. Google or whatever it is that this isn't right. And when you have a touch screen, you can actually close the feedback loop and say, was this accurate? Yes, no. And also That's because it's a screen, it can be reformatted and redapted as time goes by. You're not stuck with mm -hmm. just one way of doing something. Yeah. On the oh, Fire TV, actually, when you use Echo, uh, there are little cards that pop up that give right. you more information than just the voice feedback. So that could be useful. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super excited about that. I'm wondering, though, I, we haven't seen too many cameras kind of targeted inside bedrooms or like where your clothes would be. Right. This seems like a crazy hacking opportunity and a really gross <laughs> one too. So we'll see. Super gross. But I also like, I also would like, I don't think if I, I mean, I set up, uh, I signed up for an invitation. Um, and like, I don't think I would ever set this up in a place where I was getting dressed mm -hmm. like more than it would more be a place where because you might share your picture. So it's like, oh, well, I would put it in a place where I would be able to walk up to it like a, you know, a full length mirror in my office or whatever, where it's like I walk up to it and, and do my picture and then I walk away. Um, but well, yeah, for people like, in your business, like it would be hugely valuable when, you know, we used to do tech TV and we when we had a stylist, they'd take a picture of everything you wore with, and put it in a notebook with the date and everything so that you would know and you wouldn't repeat. And if something didn't work, you wouldn't use it. I mean, that is valuable information. I could see Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a lot of people, it's mostly women, I would imagine, but there's a lot of people who would be very interested in this. Well, I think and, even like young men, uh, like that that age demo again, like getting into, you know, where yeah, a lot, a lot of guys 25 care about and this younger, stuff. a lot of yeah. guys really care yeah. about that. And, and we're seeing more and more men get into beauty blogging and fashion, you know, yeah, like it's it's certainly an expanding industry for, so you, for men of just blowing up. This will be, a, you know, it's so funny because I've talked to so many people who said, oh, this is a non-starter. Nobody's going to buy this. This is such an invasion in privacy i think the exact opposite i think you do too ashley this is a hit i think people i think it'll start slowly um but i do think i, I think right away it won't be in stock it'll be like uh, the original echo i mean it was like it took how long months right. before people were able to just buy them so right. i think it'll be similar to that um i think amazon is very smart making this sort of an invitation only thing so that way 
Uh, if they undersell it, they don't have to uh, admit that to anybody. So um, that's yeah. that's always a really good sort of strategy sales wise. But uh, this is but not yeah, a fire really phone. Though. This is this is yeah. I think this, this is, is a, a very different. And, and I think potential. that. Yeah, I think that some people really want, like you were saying, Devendra, like a speaker, like they want that sort of, you know, I have a, a tap and I love carrying that into the yard with me. Like, that's right. great. Um, but and I hook my dot up. I mean, dot has a little speaker, but I have my dot up to speakers, yeah. every power sure, speakers. Sure, sure. And it's like it's better and, speakers and, and in the soon cylinder. it'll be, you know, able to control Sonos, which I am super excited yeah. about. Yeah, that'll be um, awesome. But, but I definitely am I'm of the mindset that it's like, I do think that Amazon is on the right track making different kinds of echoes for different users. And this is just one example of, I'm sure, many different types coming in the future. Here, there, what they, I've neglected to mention, but there will be a look app to go along with this yep. that will allow you to look at your daily wardrobe looks, rate them, rank them, share them. Uh, social, making it social. It's interesting because sure in this. And I'm sure shop style. What is it? Shop style live. The show that they do with uh, they have a, a, a fashion show that they do wow. uh, live every day on Amazon. I had no idea. And it's wow. pretty popular as far as I'm aware. Oh, so I bet it um, is. It's, yeah, it's, I think Frankie Grande is one of the hosts, and um, it's you know like these sort of really big fashion influencers, like digital influencers that host it. And uh, yeah, I think I mean I think this could be a really popular thing. And if people are not sure about style look, like you can actually use it in your phone. So it's it's in the Amazon app, like already. Mm. You can use this as a feature. Yeah. So here's this is so uh, hard because you have to hold your phone out. And right, exactly. Well, that's, so well, that's how Snapchat works today, right? So this is just taking what Snapchat does and just monetizing it. My yeah, daughters, so like for example, are forever taking photos of themselves. Right. So instead of having a conversation or typing words or emoticons, they just take a just photo of themselves. You're an Instagram dad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Snapchat. Mm -hmm. dad. Snapchat dad. Snapchat dad. Yeah. Snap dad. You're Snap dad. No idea. Yeah, they, have, like, they already have it in this Amazon app. It's like you can go right here. It says outfit compare and you just oh, tap on that and it's Look at that. that's style look. So you can try it. Like, if you're not really sure if you want to use it or buy an Echo Look. You know, Macy's and Nordstrom are, and Penny's are already under huge pressure, the brick-and-mortar stores. Yep. This is the na the la this is the final nail in the coffin. I mean... It's tough for them. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm in my early 30s, and, like, why would I want to go to a department store when I know how to measure my body? Like, really? So you don't feel... Generally. I mean, obviously... <laughs> I don't need to go to a department store. I'll buy anything <laughs> online. But you don't you you do not shop anymore. You buy online. Generally, I don't um, unless it's an emergency or I need a last minute thing or something right. really specific. And but you don't want to try it on in the store. You're I willing. I my wife does this too. She'll order ten things. Yeah. Try them on, and they, it's and they very it easy to send back the ones you don't want. Often that'll be all ten. Yeah. No big and I deal. Got really, I got really mad the other week at um, 6 p.m., which is surprisingly owned by Amazon. They make you pay for your own return shipping, oh. which is oh, yeah. for shoes, which is they're heavy and that's terrible. Zappos so, um, never did. Yeah. yeah, Zappos doesn't do that, but yeah. they both are owned by Amazon, which is right. super bizarre. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Bring just up, uh, retail, by the way, is a good point because going to retail, talking to somebody there saying like, you know, do you guys have anything that you would recommend or just somebody you can ask, like, how does this look on me? That is the feedback loop that they're kind of trying right. to close on online. Right. So that could be interesting. Yeah. I see a couple yeah. of also, interesting trends. I don't really want to ask somebody in a department store, like, hey, does this look good on me? Because you don't know I don't who they know are. if I trust them. I don't, right. I don't know what their fashion <laughs> sense is. But if a computer yeah. is learning about my fashion and right. saying, okay, yes, this looks better on you than this, then, like, maybe I trust a computer a little bit more. But also... Uh, like my Twitter bio says, I want to be a robot when I grow up. So there you go. Right. Well, at least you'll <laughs> have a robot dressing you. Yeah. yeah. I think it's pretty interesting styles. that I was reading some research this week about how long retail will last. And what, they, what they're finding out is that you only need to lose 25% of your current business. Oh, man. And your whole company goes out of business. Yikes. Because the costs of your retail are fixed, right? And the margin. So as soon as you lose 25% of your business, you might as well you just close up shop and walk away. So Amazon only has to beat its competitors. It doesn't have to blow them out of the water. It just has mm -hmm. to keep lowering the ceiling to the point where there's no – where the ceiling meets the floor and then these people are dead. 25%. So, 25%. And they already are. I mean this is Well, like you saw the it layout last week in the New York Times. We talked about this last week. Zombie yeah. malls uh, mm -hmm. as, as these malls just die because they're – Anchor tenants, the big department stores go away, and there is nothing left. And yeah. look what's replacing it, right? This is Amazon, Amazon warehouses warehouse. with robots. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, there's something like 33 square feet of mall space for every citizen, American citizen. <laughs> it's already yeah. too much. <laughs> too so much. there's definitely an oversupply of mall space. So the malls are going to close anyway. So there's a couple of interesting trends here. One is uh, Echo entering verticals. Uh, and this is, of course, if you're Amazon, the very first vertical you'd enter. This is the most lucrative vertical. It writes right down their alley. But I could see other verticals. It's also interesting because it ties into, and this is where Snapchat's done so well, individuals creating their own content. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and I, this is something I'm kind of intrigued by. It's the trend we've been moving in the direction of. When blogging first started, the whole idea of everybody would have a blog and everybody could... Mm -hmm create content then youtube came along everybody could create videos uh this is it's getting easier and easier with snapchat uh, instagram everybody is becoming a content creator now you got a camera that's already connected to the internet that's ready to take your picture your instagram husband ready and waiting at any time <laughs> and i could see it in other verticals too i mean i think this i wonder if amazon's going to start slicing off you know these these vertical markets starting with the most lucrative i was thinking it well, would be I, really interesting for the hobby market to have something like the look uh but you know with it maybe a touch screen for your make, something like that your make uh, making things or you're making something craft your crafting something like that uh yeah. woodworking uh, yeah. you know garage work where you literally can watch your how-to video for whatever thing that it is you're doing um you can just pull that right up and, and as you point out greg it's a virtuous uh, circle because they're mm -hmm. also getting all this machine learning on the content you're providing them, and that enha mm -hmm. enhances That's their right. value. Right. It, which means that, is, that Amazon is in some ways a better position than Google. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and more importantly, Amazon has no profit motive. It's convinced its investors that it can build for growth over a seven-year cycle. Right. So you look at somebody like well, I'm trying to think of some retail names in the U.S., Macy's and Nordstrom's and yep. that sort of stuff. Yep. Is, mm -hmm. is that right? right? Yep. So That's right. Those people H &M. have to deliver 20% of their profits back to their investors as dividends every year, whereas Amazon says, I can take that 20% and put it you back bet. into this thing Smartest that we're Smartest thing about. Jeff Bezos yeah. did, and it was a struggle in the early decade uh, because investors at one point stopped giving him money, saying, you're not going to turn a profit. No, but I'm building for the future. So he had to borrow money. But he's proven right now. Yep. Everybody goes, oh, that guy's a genius. <laughs> we knew it all along. Space rocket. <laughs> yeah. Now he's building a space rocket yeah. to get himself yeah. off the planet. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to know more about this, have a search on YouTube for Scott Galloway, how Amazon is dismantling retail. I'll try and send you the link. Yeah, uh, the chat room uh, just mentioned that as well. Yeah. yeah he's I a professor of marketing at uh, NYU. Yeah. So he did a 25-minute video. Around about the 10-minute mark, he gives you a demo. One of the more invidious or uh, trick, tricks that, that's going to happen is variable pricing. So what Amazon is, is when you go onto the Amazon Echo and say, and he does a demo of this live on stage, actually. He says, give me the price of some batteries. And it comes back with a price. And it says, but when I did this yesterday, it gave me a price that was a dollar extra. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things is once Amazon's got you captive – um, you have this interesting situation where Amazon can give you prices that vary over time. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just amazing what they do uh, to do this. And there was a Washington Post article, I think. Hopefully I can find it. Let me try. Uh, talking about the same thing about the death of fixed pricing uh, and how Amazon is leading that and how much of a change that's going to make to society. They're so interesting, their algorithms and how algorithmically driven all the pricing and all the moving mm. is going on on Amazon. I have a friend who sells through Amazon. More increasingly, stuff you buy on Amazon is not sold by and often not fulfilled by Amazon. Uh, they're just a storefront for uh, people selling content all over the world. He sells an air purifier that he uh, got made in China to his specifications. It's got his brand right on it, sells it on Amazon, and mm. he noted that all of a sudden his sales tanked. He investigated and found out that Amazon was selling his product itself. Oh, and, yes. and then he changed, he dropped his price below Amazon's price, and then Amazon's price didn't go down. It went up. And huh. he, had, he had some theories about this, but the, clearly, algorithmically, they were deciding whether they should compete with him or instead offer the product at a higher price, get fewer purchases, but make more money on them. it's And it's all happening 
as as you say, Greg, over yep. over periods of minutes. That's right. This article, I, I can't find it, unfortunately, but this article was talking about that at Christmas time, the price of pumpkin spice. Is that something that's <laughs> uniquely American? I don't know what that is. It's um, it's a u- uniquely hated as well, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's very but big. You could go on to Amazon and buy pumpkin spice, but as in the ramp up to Christmas, the price of pumpkin spice triples. Yes, of course. And then as soon as Christmas is over, the price goes through the floor and the variable pricing is literally. So this idea of going to the supermarket to buy a can of pumpkin spice, which you expect to pay $2, $2 for, 365 days a year might be going away. And what are the impacts of that? But uh, what Scott Galloway is pointing to in his thing is not only is pricing going to be variable and changing at any given point in time, and it may well be that once Amazon knows that you're a white, middle-class, successful male with an income over, you know, six-figure income, your price might be $10. But if you're coming from a lower socioeconomic group, then maybe the price that it'll sell you the product is $6. That's the first one. And the mm-hmm. second one is is what you're leading to in your previous part is about the death of brands. So today we have Procter & Gamble and Unilever with these massively successful brands built around branded toilet paper and branded laundry detergent and trusted by millions and blah, blah, blah. But if you go on to an election, uh, you know, or a Google Voice, or a, you know, one of these a Siri and say, "Siri, buy me some washing liquid." Which ones are going to ship you? Why doesn't it just ship you the Amazon no-name brand, right. where Amazon takes an eighty percent profit margin for minimum effort, and bam, the brands are mm-hmm. dead. Yeah, he's got he talks about that in his video as well. With uh, I'm going to have to watch this video. This is this is actually quite uh, quite fascinating. He actually gave it at an Amazon. L2 clinic. Here's the example he uses with the baby wipes, where it's yeah. it's it's basically an a, a agnostic. Uh, Alexa, buy batteries. I do not want a, a Amazon Basics batteries. No, <laughs> I, I have no, no batteries to offer you. I'm sorry. That's exact. So what he's saying there is Alexa, buy batteries, and Alexa says. Here, here at price of Amazon Basics batteries is $7.99. Do you want me to order them for you? He says, no. And Alexa says, I have nothing else to give you. Wow. So you can only have whatever Alexa yeah. is going to offer I think, you. and I've tried this because I've had this kind of battle, this, this, <laughs> this fight with, with Echo at home. And I think you could ask for a brand name, like buy EverReady hey, batteries or, yeah. or Antelope batteries, and it would do it. But you're right. I get a lot of Amazon Basics <laughs> products because i <laughs> but you know i don't but you're, mind but it's a generic request I'm right not, you're making a generic I'm request i'm not complaining oh, yeah. uh, and it comes two days i didn't you know uh, that's one of the reasons we have dots in every room because when i run out of something i can get it right there right then rather than trying to remember putting it on a list in, inevitably i'll forget right. three days later I'll go, oh i needed batteries no i just so i order everything that way and i don't care if they're amazon basics why should I care? It's a commodity. Yeah, but the point is, what does that do to brands, and how does that disrupt? Well, um, you know, multi like the uh, Unilever and Procter and Gamble, they're you know multi billion dollar companies purely built with brands that have built up over fifty to seventy years, and that whole business could be disrupted well, in me, less than a decade. What did you let say though that Leo is a brand built up over fifty to seventy years? <laughs> mm. More like sixty, but okay. Let me show you. See this box? It's right in between there. See? Got to show you this box. Look inside this box. What is this box? It's full of batteries, and it's yeah. got a dash button. Now, interestingly, Amazon is still selling dash buttons. This is an Energizer dash button, right? So when this box gets low, is this John? Where do we keep this? This is a Right there behind the uh, desk. So if we run low on batteries, you press. <coughs> That's brilliant You know what I love is itself. the ability to get a get the uh, get these push buttons and be able to custom program them with my computer and an Echo. So like, uh, if I say, okay, I want it to buy this thing, then you click on it in your profile and you set it up and you connect it to like a particular button. I'm like, that's the thing you get. But do you think it's in Amazon's interest in the long run to get rid of brands? Because uh, I guess they make more yes. money on basics, but they don't. Well, they really? make more money on basics, but then, of course, they do want brands to do business with them. Right. So I'm sure it's probably a right. bit of a balancing it's act. A little, no, no, yeah. no, not at all. What they want is brands that they can dominate. Today's brands, yeah. Procter & Gamble, is as big, bigger than Amazon. Well, they have, you know, customers are demanding the brand, so Amazon has to sell it. On the terms that the brands yeah, Walmart, have. So Walmart the- has that kind of clout too, and Walmart absolutely strong arms the brands. Mm-hmm. But I, I've got to think the brands fight, try to fight back in some way. I don't know how they would. But uh, you know, where it are you going to go to fight back? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How are you going to fight back? Go back to I mean, TV. Where do you go? Yeah. Yeah. 
like in those Amazon results that we were talking about, let's just jump right back to where we were at the first article. Amazon's ad revenues grew by like 100% yeah. in a quarter. Yeah. And they're now the fourth or fifth largest online advertising provider. Mm -hmm. And the only place they advertise is on their own sites. So you want to think about that in terms of how much money they can make out of just advertising on Amazon um, and then how that feeds into this loop. So they can actually drive the brands out of business because the only place brands can can achieve that 25%, right? Keep in mind that you can still sell stuff through Walmart and Macy's and not whatever those supermarkets are, but you've still got to get that extra 25% to be in business and Amazon is going to have that and they're going to have them by the short and curlies. And then if they can say, well, you know, we'll just promote our own brand, then – you know where does where do the brands go? This is bad for consumers ultimately because uh, it eliminates competition and Amazon in the end. Ah, uh, see, dominates. but no, because what it'll allow is the emergence of new types of brands that are internet only. So why mm -hmm. are you buying Tide soap from Procter and Gamble right. with a sixty to eighty percent markup? Right. Why don't so take for example, um, you know these. Uh, food delivery services, right, That like Uber and Deliveroo and all that sort of stuff. And what is happening now is in certain locations like New York, there are restaurants that are not restaurants. They're just a factory that produces food <laughs> for delivery. Right. Right? right. They so have one chair now, just in case, just so for the – No, 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 they don't. It's just literally the, <laughs> yeah, they're the just, writers. Yeah, it's, it's basically a pop-up. It's they, wow. they, There's somebody who does this in um, – in an Gosh, industrial they do it in, yep. uh, Yeah, they do it in an industrial area in L.A. And they yep. make amazing food. Like the, the reviews on Yelp are unbelievable, but they it's only take orders till a certain time. Because the food and it's is all custom delivery designed only. for yeah. home delivery on the back of a courier, wow. right? So yep. instead of lamenting the death of the live restaurant and you know and or maybe just having some food that you get a bit of a lift in sales by selling some out the back door to a delivery driver what you do is you change the business model and you set up a an industrial building with a commercial kitchen and you create food that is only for sale by couriers that's the emergence of new business models and that's yeah. uh, you know the secret of everything we do about the internet right are we going to talk about ebooks at all and sure, how sure. ebooks have dropped away by 30% um, we had a, several articles this week talking about massive drops in ebooks, and the publishers were beating their chests and saying, you know, rise of the paperback book, it's here because ebook sales have dropped by 17%. No. But what they, <laughs> yeah, right? But what they're conveniently leaving out is that um, you cannot, uh, is that as much as the publishers are selling, the independent authors are now selling directly to customers. That's right. That's yeah. what's happening. Right, yeah. And so the publishers might be selling 17% ebooks, less ebooks, but I promise you the market is much, much larger. And I found some statistics on that, um, which I could share with you today. Uh, Trent Griffin was showing me the statistics. He's saying uh, indie self published books and regular retail books are something in the order of 500,000. Small to medium ebooks is 200,000, and Amazon publishing is 300,000. So what you're saying is the big five publisher ebook sales is 250,000. Indie self-published plus indie self-published full books is three times the size of big five publisher sales. So, a, but I a think 17 that, that, all, that all comes back to, I mean, even the shopping thing, Leo and and Greg is like, it's it's a it's a matter of like I tend not to go do my shopping at department stores because I want to find, uh, and I have the ability to find individuals who are uh, self-publishing making their own clothing lines, starting up their own beauty brands that are smaller, more curated, and more designed towards me as a customer, as opposed to a really large group of people. And then for everything else, well, Amazon Basics is fine. But it's yes. like there are those certain things that I'm like, I want something very highly curated. And now uh, more and more, we're having the ability to do that. It's, you know, there are even companies that are now making shampoo and conditioner that's specifically made for yours type of hair you like to answer a quiz mm. and then they custom mix it and send it to you and i, I mean this is like you know this sort of that you know stuff it doesn't it like scale goop. though those are small business artisanal businesses right they don't see it mm. scaling i don't uh, think and, they and, scale and but they're the thing aiming is, is, at a, a affluent market because most they're right right because can, because i don't think you can really scale on the low end anymore in such a way that would compete with an amazon right. and i think that that's sort of the that's that's kind of the really weird evolution of what's going on right now. Like I think an, a Walmart or an Amazon is 
you know, if you don't play ball with them, like, and you want to scale, they're going to eat your lunch, you know? It makes sense that ebooks would die because uh, you don't need a storefront for ebooks. You don't, there's no physical sure. product. Anybody can deliver a podcast or an yes. ebook or any digital product without help from an intermediary. Well, you need you need a storefront. You do need a digital storefront. A digital storefront. You know, yeah, we've had like yeah, there are random PDFs all over the internet. There, are, it, it's centralizing content. That's what we've learned with the App Store too, right? Like it's that's kind of discovery finding, becomes the issue. Discovery yeah, and install, yes. right? Yeah, because there's so much out there, and it's and it's all being distributed in so many different ways. Yeah, well, and but the point is, is that um, you might well be using Amazon as a delivery mechanism. So if you're using the Amazon online shopping experience. So there's, you're seeing the emergence of startups now who build a product and the only place you can buy it is on Amazon. Now that mm -hmm. is a change in the retail where, sure, you're out there marketing and reaching users and driving sales and engagement, but when they want to buy it, so I bought some vitamins this week um, and the, I went to the company's website to check them out. I checked them all out and when I went to click buy, it just went to Amazon's website. That is a perfect yeah. example of a change in business model where before they would have had to have a, a warehouse and a distribution mechanism, yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's they a just win, went to it's Amazon. It's a win all around because you feel more comfortable buying it from Amazon anyway. Right. Well, arguably, right? I'm not a huge fan of Amazon like well, most people Well, you may are. not like them, but most people say, oh, hey, this is even better. I know I do this. If I could yeah. buy a product from Amazon or from the vendor... I'll always buy mm -hmm. it from Amazon if the price is mm -hmm. the same, just because I know Amazon. I trust yeah. Amazon. Well, the so point it's is, easier. Like, you know, Amazon it's easier. They have my credit yeah. card. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything's already there. It's all. It's it's very so, convenient. So so, if you're making a product that you can deliver yourself, a digital product, uh, there's really no reason to go through a middleman, except mm -hmm. you do have to solve this discovery issue. You have to somehow so, find an audience and have the audience. And that's what influences are, are for. Yeah, how does how does this exactly look in this that. new era? You know, obviously, if you're making a good, if you're selling spinner fidgets, fidget spinners, you got to get somebody who's going to fulfill it. You you need somebody like Amazon, somebody with warehouses. Sure. Uh, you, you, that that makes sense, and that's going to all centralize through probably Amazon. But if you're a, if you're a podcaster or a, uh, you're an author, um, what do I mean, Devendra? You uh, mm -hmm. it, it, as a you you're a writer. As a writer, I would think that this uh, offers all sorts of interesting possibilities. Same thing for musicians, but they always come back to me and say the same thing. But how do I rise above? How do I find an audience? How, yeah, you know. That's, I mean, I remember like when blogging first got uh, first got started, it was all about you know getting your SEO ranking up and yeah. where you stood on Google, and then more niche things started happening. You know, Google News popped up, and then it was all about the Google News juice, and then. Things like tech meme for tech bloggers, well, like that's a thing. What we really happened was demand yeah. media, which was content yep. tailored around mm -hmm. search results, mm -hmm. fake news, and when all the negatives rose to the surface, um, yeah. If you're, but if you're somebody who's writing, you know, if you're a Ben Thompson who's writing a stratechery, uh, you know, the the real challenge for you, I would imagine, is, I mean, it's one of the reasons you probably still work for Engadget, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you could branch out on your i don't want to scare your employers no, but you uh, everybody like a, yeah a, anybody can become an independent contractor or something try to do everything and what stops but, yeah, you, from you don't doing have that? an audience. audience um i mean for me also i like engadget and i like the people i work with um it's a site i love and it's a thing i believe in and i want to build um doing your own thing is so much more tough and so much more risky too um it's I, nice it, it comes it's nice ways, to get right? a health plan <laughs> it's nice it to is. get a paycheck every other week yeah and that's all a lot of people all, prefer that. It's all that. very nice. Yeah. Um, and that's, also, that sounds nice. See, know, I, live, I live in a country where freedom is built into the healthcare system. So mm -hmm. that's, anyway, an that's, you know, <laughs> it, that's actually a really interesting point. Different. If we had yeah. a national health, that would yeah. change things dramatically yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. Because it would the, encourage the, people to take more risks. You'd see I much think. more entrepreneurialism. You'd see much more individual uh, startups because that would be one whole chunk. That's a big Risk college factor. too. College debt too is another really good example of that. Yeah, I mean, if you're not if so, you're not a hundred thousand dollars in the hole when really you leave college, point. that's a you really have good some money point. to maybe start your own business. If you start you know, with a clean slate, you've got health. Mm -hmm. uh, all you need to do is make rent and food. That means it's a lot easier. The barrier entry is mm -hmm. a lot easier, and you could take a chance on yourself. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's exactly but, what. So my business, of course, is exactly that, Leo. So Packet Pushes is a five years of sweat equity is a nighttime job uh, building a podcast and publishing shows and blog posts week in, week out. And then two years ago, I was able to go full time and drop my salary by 50 percent. But um, we we're able so to. So why make- does innovation still happen here to the degree that it doesn't happen in the UK? Or Canada, uh, or every other just, developed nation, because we're the, one of the last not to offer single. Well, a certain, a certain, you know, the thing is that uh, if you've ever been in the ocean and you know dropped a little turd in there, something floats to the top, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the answer is with enough people, something's going to float to the top. You know, of, are of you the, saying the, that? <laughs> man, I'm going to try to understand what you just said about and the United also, States. Okay, I, I don't think, think it's it was also good. Let me see if I can figure your, this out. So basically, like, think of it this way. Uh, France has bas- that has close to the population of uh, California. Right. So if you're looking Why at aren't they you know, as productive the sheer, as California, sheer scale. Um, well, our GDP in California, I think, is like really close to France. So I think actually it's like kind of the same. So, but oh, okay. um, oh, good. All right. but like, but if you look at just sheer scale, um, there are a lot of people who uh, try businesses and fail. And and so mm-hmm. um, and I do think that because we have a a very uh, capitalism friendly, uh, country. I think that that is an encouragement. I think that to see these, um, these guys like Bezos, and, you could just say, uh, you could actually okay, just, just say it's, just cult- right there it's and cultural just, and despite it's cultural. the economic, despite the economic disincentives, the cult, that culture always will win. People will do what what they emotionally want to do, regardless of the of the California logical calculus. California is not calculus. the only place where people are successful in the world. You're yes, so it is. Far up your own bums. Let's face it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we're just using just it as an really example because we because right? Leo lives there here. There is innovation <laughs> happening all over the world. It doesn't just happen in California or San Francisco or Silicon Valley. It's everywhere. Like I live yeah, in the UK. It's, it's it is the point. fifth largest it's... economy in the world. There is a startup incubator just down the road that's bigger than but most money. Money is probably easier to get venture capital is probably easier to get in the u.s yeah. than it is in the, you the can UK. get stupid ideas funded faster in the u.s than most places that's right um look at the right. juicero yeah and but i can do mm-hmm. the same thing in london there's no shortage of stupid startups being funded it's, it's actually very different though like i when i used to cover like startups more directly like international startups it was always very different how each country would approach it you know france and the uk versus america like there is that idea i think some countries are trapped in a sort of traditionalism where even if you're trying to do something cool and new uh the people around you are like oh no that'll never work like well i, that, I used to idea. for two uh, yeah. several years in a row i spoke at uh le web in france mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. lot of the purpose of le web is to kind of foster this kind of uh uh freewheeling capitalism that's that occurs in the united states and there were definitely cultural and financial barriers to that yeah. a lot of it was an aversion to taking risk Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, they, they were very clear about that. And, yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons to why startups do and don't work. But you certainly can't generalize and say that innovation only happens in California or that the U.S. is better at innovation. I'm than not saying, saying that. 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 Well, I, I don't wouldn't think say that. With, said that at all. And I wouldn't yeah, say that with you, you in the room said. anyway. You said exactly well, that. No, you said no, so no, you, I, innovation in America better than anywhere else. And that is well, we completely are, Wait a minute. We are better than anyone else. I didn't. All right, let's take a break. Break you off. know, they're yeah. maybe better at technology startups, but you know what? There's a whole spectrum of industries that are startups no, are funding up. Of course, all the time. Greg. Of course. So, yes. Of course. Of course. And we're sorry we had about the whole revolution <laughs> thing. We, you know. <laughs> I want my tea back. <laughs> You can borrow uh, borrow Paul Allen's submarine. Yeah. Bottom yeah. of the harbor. It. It's at the Boston hey, Harbor. It's all down there. That'd be nice. <laughs> Her Majesty would certainly appreciate getting that back. Yeah. I'm sure. If I ever knew her. Actually, you're Australian. You got nothing to talk about here. <laughs> Australia part of the is... Uh, I would say Australia is in many respects culturally more like the United States in terms of kind of go, go-getter and energy and... Uh, independence. Independence yeah. and all of that. Uh, so... Australia was when I grew up was much very anglophile was right. very aligned with the, right. uh, with um, the British and the, and the English and all that sort of stuff and as time goes by Australia has um, become Americanized so right. through my say 20s to 30s uh, Australia was very Amer- becoming increasingly Americanized and then there was a distinct shift into Asia so uh, Australia realized that America really didn't uh, want to be a 
it's, it's a love hate sort of a you know we love you this year but not so much next year right. sort of thing and so australia turned much more towards asia so now you have this culture which is very rich because you've got Asian influences, very close ties with the Americans, but a foundation in the European cultures or specifically the English culture. And it actually ends up – it's n not sufficient to make a generalization that Australia is very Americanized when it's actually much more Asianized currently. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to emulate somebody, that's not a bad person to emulate. I mean, they, uh, Well, you want to be nice to your neighbors because they might Yeah, they're right like up you. the coast, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's take a break. We'll have more with uh, with our great panel, Devendra Hardwar from Engadget, Ashley Esketa from CNET, and, uh, of course, Greg Farrow from Packet Pushers. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're the person in your business that's doing the hiring, I've got the best way to do it. And it does not involve your email box. It does not involve your phone and your desk. Uh, it does not involve spending hours going from job site to job site posting your listing. And it, it's simple. It's ZipRecruiter. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post once, and it immediately goes to 100-plus job boards, including social networks, with just a click of the mouse. You could screen, rate, and hire the right candidate fast because instead of coming into your inbox, all of those applicants, and you'll start getting applicants within the first 24 hours, all of them go into the ZipRecruiter interface where the, 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 their resumes are formatted so it's easy for you to scan them. They're all uniform where you can even ask screening questions, true, false, yes, no, multiple choice, even essay questions, to screen out the candidates who don't fit your needs, rank the rest, hire the right person fast. You gotta, if, you're, if you're filling a position at your company, you're doing one of the most important things your company does. Companies are made of people. The right person can make your company succeed. The wrong one can bring it to its knees. We all know that. We all know that. And if you're the hiring person, you're probably also the firing person. And you know you don't ever want to hire somebody you're going to have to fire down the road. So that's why you use ZipRecruiter. The right person's out there. You just have to figure out how to get to them. ZipRecruiter is the easiest, fastest way to do it. No wonder more than a million companies have used ZipRecruiter. Many of the Fortune 100 and many small businesses like ours and medium-sized businesses too. Right now you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Try it free. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Make your job, make your life easier. Do a better job. Hire the right person fast at ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Man, I, th there's pressure on me now because we've had so <laughs> much fun in the last... Mm -hmm. I've picked the right topics. I think I got to... <laughs> Should, I just wanted next. to pick up on something from the last one where we talked about how discovery was important. Yes. And then we Apple didn't really has address reduced that. the – Yeah, and then I, one of the fascinating things that's coming to me is this Apple reducing its affiliate yeah. fees from 7% to 2.5%. If what we talked about is valid and true, and I'm not sure – you know, I thought we all agreed to it to some extent. I think why so. Why would Apple suddenly reduce its affiliate fees and not encourage – influencers and for people to engage and participate in promoting their products. So Does I've he, talked to a number of tech blogs, uh, uh, maybe Devendra has some input on this too, a number of tech blogs that a significant amount of their revenue comes from links to the app store and the tech blog. And they used to make 7% of the you know money made by you know purchasing that app. Apple on May 1st will lower it by 64% to 2.5%. And uh, it, now, that's going to not going to affect you and me buying apps. It's not going to affect the company selling the apps, but it may very well affect uh, a number of publications, for instance, that use these uh, affiliate fees for revenue. Uh, Devinder, you have any thoughts on that? I I don't know like how that works on our end. Um, I don't know if Engadget does. Engadget yeah. probably doesn't have to. I don't think we do. Yeah, yeah. and I wouldn't know because it's we a don't lot of the smaller sort of Apple thing. sites though do that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm and like Wirecutter. And yeah, I think, Wirecutter. Like, you know, those sites rely on affiliate yeah. links a lot. This was a weird announcement because it just seems incredibly petty, in a way. Like it's is Apple trying to cut costs? I don't like the App Store is one of their big money makers. It would make sense to encourage more growth there. Uh, or maybe they don't feel like they need to. Maybe it's so big now they don't need to really like you know sweeten the pot for these people. Frederico maybe it's that uh, they Vitici. feel like they uh, they want to be the people curating because I know they've mm -hmm. made a little bit of an effort to you know curate a little bit better mm -hmm. in the in the app store like the featured sections and things like that. Um, maybe that's 
all they feel. It, they Amazon need. has lowered its affiliate fees too, right? I mean, that used to I be a great way to make money. A lot of it, yeah. In fact, if you were as an author, I made more money from Amazon if you bought a book on my website than I did from the publisher. That was more than my royalties, <laughs> which is a sad commentary in the state of royalties. But I think mm -hmm. Amazon has dropped those as well. So maybe this is just they can. I don't know. What about if Apple yeah. starts selling ads on its – it has started to sell ads. You can – developers can now pay to have their products promoted on the Apple's App Store. What if Apple gets into ads and it wants that 5% um, to be able to throw into an ad campaign, so to build up an ad network that they can then sell directly to vendors? It, I, it may they be that. It may also be – and I've seen this, you see this not symmetrically with the apps, but you see it with antivirus companies. A lot of antivirus companies uh, pump up their sales by using uh, these kinds of affiliate fees. And there's kind of resellers. Mm. And what you get, I think, is a lot of sketchy websites mm. and kind of sketchy or suspect mm. marketing techniques. Uh, it may be that Am Apple felt like it was losing control of how apps were marketed. And There's they certainly some people who game the system. I mean, it's uh, like, and have these sort of exactly. propped up websites. But it, it, the thing is, is there, I'm sure there are a lot of those and I'm sure Apple wants to, you know, obviously curb that, but there are in the process, like you were saying, I mean, all there's a lot of sites like Touch Arcade who writes great reviews of, of iOS and Android games. Um, they will suffer tremendously right. because right. of that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that, that is, it's not all of their revenue, but it certainly is a good chunk of it. And, uh, you know, you don't want to lose writers on a site like that. You don't want to lose people who are hardworking uh, just because Apple cut it, you know, cut it a certain percentage. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a bummer. It's a real bummer. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I feel bad for all of the sites that are on the up and up and really just need that money to survive uh, that are, you know, I think being punished a little bit because of some less than uh, less than pure actors in the in the space. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to always remember that if you're, what is the, what is it, a dick dick bird that lives on the back of a hippopotamus <laughs> in a symbiotic mm -hmm. relationship <laughs> that it picks off the parasites, and you just got to hope that the hippopotamus doesn't turn around and eat you. Yeah. Or it's, yeah. A, it's a crocodile yeah. or an alligator. They they pick the, they actually, mm -hmm. you've seen the pictures of them going in the mouth of the alligator, like, the alligator's sitting here with, ah. Uh, they clean its teeth, <laughs> they pick out all the stuff. Apple could, you know, uh, Apple's the alligator, and if you, if you live on the crumbs, mm -hmm. The alligator's mm -hmm. given you, you, you can always. Um. It, was the, it was the same story with online retailers, too, right? I remember in the late 90s, like s some of the earliest online stores had affiliate programs. They were like 10% or more sometimes. Uh, I used to buy video games from gamecave.com and uh, I had a little website and people were buying through it. And then all like the, the company disappeared in a year, probably because yeah. I was making a lot of money off affiliate links. Here is right. the mm -hmm. Egyptian plover. Cleaning the teeth <laughs> of the little crocodile. Man, that is better than any circus you could pay to money to go see. <laughs> that, is an, that is a very brave thing to do. I want to see I that, that on VR Planet experience. Earth 3. <laughs> yeah, where's that VR experience? You stick your head in a, you know, stick exactly, your head in an alligator maw. Uh, oh, it's a crocodile, my bad. Crocod you know, yeah. I, what's the difference? It's all good. Look, I, I live I on the West so. Coast. I don't see either of them. So, yeah. it's, I mean. <laughs> right. I've been I guess watching that's what uh, the if you BBC. Don't have a tongue, right? right. Somebody's got to yeah. clean your teeth. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No toothbrushes. No, no they can't um, reach their teeth. Here's their another. Arms are too short. Here's another tiny little company suffering from Apple beating it up. Qualcomm. <laughs> Apple stopped paying Qualcomm's. Uh, Who's gonna think of the little guy here, Leo? Yeah. <laughs> Apple stopped paying Qualcomm royalties because they say, "Hey, you're asking for too much." Qualcomm had to warn. Our profits are going to drop significantly uh, <laughs> because we're not getting that eight to nine percent uh, lower revenue than previous forecasts. Because Apple has not been able to reach an agreement with Qualcomm for more than five years, Apple says Qualcomm's refused to negotiate fair terms. This is, you know, this is like <laughs> when the cable company. I love when the, you hear Apple going, "No, we're fair, <laughs> yeah. no fair terms fair. here." It's like, what? You're just being unfair, Qualcomm. Did you notice that Qualcomm isn't actually negotiating direct with Apple? It set up the deal in such a way that the people who make the chips that Qualcomm licenses to them, um, and then the the chip makers then charge Apple the Qualcomm fees, right? 
So Apple could never negotiate directly with Qualcomm. It had to always go via the people who made the chips. So it feels like clever. high school. Yeah. It's like, you tell yeah. Nancy yeah. <laughs> that I'm not going to go to prom with her brother. But can you do that in the Dark Overlord voice? <laughs> <laughs> just so hot. I need, I need one of those things. Like, you know, so no, we don't do business with the That's a good one too. <laughs> That's a good one too. I like it. But he's, I mean, got, maybe he's, not one of those, uh, he's got one of those Bane masks. He's got a little voice yeah. changer on it. It'll be great. Yeah. Why does Bane... Bane is, has the most... You talk, it goes up and... I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Never mind. Anyway, I forget I mentioned But I mean, you know, the in level of indirection, you, the companies right, in right. Taiwan and China that make the chips... Are paying Qualcomm I didn't realize license that. Yeah. Yeah. So now Apple can't go and beat Qualcomm up directly. And that's a brilliant piece of uh, business maneuvering. Mm -hmm. I mean, Qualcomm is one of the masters of sharp business tactics and quite honestly, couldn't happen to a nicer company. <laughs> Qualcomm has been beating up on its customers for quite some time and is not well liked. It's it's done a number of things like, like Verizon and AT&T have had a run in with Qualcomm over the CDMA technology a right. few years back. Right. You know, it's consistent. Nobody's thing. using CDMA any, anymore, but you need to use those Qualcomm chips because they own CDMA. That's right. Yeah. And uh, they were, there's, there's a whole lot of backroom dealings that Qualcomm got into to make themselves into this unique leadership position. It wasn't because their technology was better, by the way. Um, so yeah, Well, but there, well like there's an irony here because Apple used is trying to second source the radio chips in their iPhones. They went to Intel, but the Intel chips are so crappy. They're half the speed yeah. of Qualcomm. Yeah. In fact, this is one of the bones of contention. Qualcomm's mad at Apple because Apple slowed down iPhones with the Qualcomm chip so they wouldn't be faster yeah. than the Intel yeah. chip. That's not good. That's all. So, Everybody's acting poorly here. Everybody yes. loses here, guys. Everybody loses. Everybody is losing we here. We put in a better chip, but we're going to slow it down. Yeah. All right. Both companies are also in the middle of suing each other. So, right. you know. This yeah, is yeah. A oh, no. Messy situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Apple says Qualcomm's ways. withheld a billion dollars in fee, mm -hmm. license fees. So, And honestly, I'd love to be able to withhold my rent because I think it's unfair. <laughs> That's I unfair. don't. Yeah. Can anyone yeah. do this? No. Huh? You I'd love to big. withhold any payment on anything because I feel it's unfair and <laughs> yeah. still get that yeah. thing. Like yeah. I just, yeah, that's a good point, Devidra. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Jimmy Wales, guy who created Wikipedia, is now creating a new news site or trying to crowdfund a new news site called Wiki Tribune. That will. It's annoying journalists because they are having to work with real people to. <laughs> To create these uh, articles, the idea is, uh, and I actually put some money into this, so here's a disclaimer. Uh, uh, journalists will write the stories, but then, uh, much as uh, Wikipedia uses uh, independent contributors, uh, people who, you know, grammar checkers, fact checkers, um, fact finders, whistleblowers will then contribute to the story equally, uh, which I think, uh, okay. Devendra, you're a journalist. What do you think of this? Is this a good plan? It's, uh, I don't know if it's as revolutionary as Jimmy Wales thinks it is. And uh, just the idea of like a large scale independent, um, you know, orga media organization, that's that's basically the Associated Press, isn't it? Uh, the the crowd like stuff. Or, or well, ProPublica, right? ProPublica yeah. is a and very Pro good example of this, yeah. 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 And ProPublica so has found its voice uh, in the Trump mm -hmm. era. It's become... Uh, well, a great source for fake news, uh, according to Trump. So, <laughs> so um, this, I just wonder how this is not going to, because the thing is, is facts, like we've seen facts tend to be considered, like it's it's so bizarre. This whole thing has been so bizarre to kind of live through. You mean I'm the sure fake, the whole fake news thing? But it's like, yeah, when, like, when you have something that is the truth, like regardless of what side it helps, like sometimes mm -hmm. it helps one side over the other. And so people weaponize that. And so I don't, I would love, I would love, I'm, I'm very curious to see how this particular project uh, makes an effort to not become weaponized. Because even ProPublica now, like, it, like you said, they're finding their voice, but some people are arguing that that is, uh, you know, oh, well, you've become liberal now. Like you're, right. you know, you're, and and so it's, it's a really, it's a hard problem and I, I, it's, it's tough to combat. And, you know, people, even before the internet, people would believe things they heard in, in a town about somebody else, a rumor or things like that. So, I mean, fake news is not all 
that uh, old. It's just, you know, really prevalent now online where it wasn't kind of before. So um, I just, yeah, I don't know how, how this is going to be received by people. Is it really going to be a source to be trusted? Or is there going to be one side or another that says, hey, this is not, uh, you know, this is now becoming weaponized. You're fighting for one side well, or more, the other. More than you know, that, the word like that. wiki is now tainted a little bit by Julian Assange mm -hmm. and WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. uh, right. We know there's, you know, people who know what a wiki is know that there's no relationship. But I think the general public might look at Wiki Tribune and WikiLeaks and conflate the two. And, uh, w you know, one, one, they actually have opposite missions, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you could yeah. say. Right. I just I, I don't know if this also does anything to help the the nature of the problem, right, of fake news, because what's happening right now, um, we are in a weird environment where reality itself is in question yes. much of the time. Yes. And that's that's the bigger problem. Like we're we're, in, you know, encroaching like double speak territory. Um, it sometimes feels like we're being gaslighted by some politicians who say something and then the next day we'll be like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't say, say that. that. I didn't what made say you that. think I don't know that? What you mean. Those lights and we don't really flickering. question it as much. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know if this solves anything. What, what would be really nice is if media companies like focused harder on like making sure we don't like start normalizing this weird reality we're in right now. Interesting article or, or by it entertainment. Like, I think that's another yeah, really big yeah. problem is that like the news has become entertainment and, and this is a bigger problem than just the last, mm -hmm. you know, six months, eight, a year or whatever. This has been happening for decades at this point. And, um, you know, when you, when you read a quote like Jeff Zucker, who is in charge of CNN, uh, considering that, you know, this is a, a big drama to him and that he's going to bring great in contributors for business. that are, yeah, exactly. Great, great for, for business, business, he and, says. Yeah. And if I bring in people that, you know, make this uh, almost seem like a dramatic reenactment of the news, um, I'll, you know, people are going to watch it and they'll be compelled to watch it. And the thing is, is just because it's interesting to look at a train wreck doesn't make it any less awful. Like, and, and mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the key there is that, it, you know, there's, there's going to have to be a moment where, uh, some real soul searching is going to have to happen on the part of these um, on the part of these news outlets, especially See, on cable. And I don't know that it will. So in my view, news was always entertainment, right? It's always been you bought the newspaper to read it. And just because you happen to get uh, viable politic, you know, balanced polit views, mm -hmm. politics, societal information, but it was always entertainment. People would sit and read the newspaper as a way of being entertained, right? It's never not been entertainment. It's just that the people who did the news got really full of their own self-importance and puffed themselves up as being the guardians of democracy and the, the gateway to truth and the only arbiters, you know, shine the light of they're, blah, 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 right? Th that's they're well, right to a certain extent, but it's also be, hypocritical yeah, to say that you're the only guardian of the truth. The Sorry, newspapers and news are, uh, has always been entertainment and that needs to adapt to yeah. the new environment because now it has to compete against I mean, Netflix, I mean, Amazon. I think to say, I, I, know, see, I disagree yeah. here. I think to say that news has always been entertainment is not accurate. I think news has mm -hmm. always been used to fill people's leisure time. Like when you read the newspaper 50 years ago, you're getting information and, and maybe there are some things that entertain you, but – now the people delivering the news have become the entertainment as opposed to the actual news itself. That's yeah, the problem. Yep. That's what I'm yep. saying. Well, That's and, what I mean by that, the news has become yeah, entertainment. And this is where, and my point is, is that the news that we get today is not fit for the medium that it's being delivered on. So when you see news being delivered in a 30 second video on Facebook live or in Instagram or whatever it is, these people haven't adapted to the modern era to deliver it in such a way that they can tell the story in the new medium. They're still stuck in the, I can publish a Sunday newspaper and make a living model. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's a new medium though. Like it's, it's the rise of like, we've seen so much social news. Like a couple of organizations are doing using Snapchat, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of uh, make their reporting better. It's not the medium. It's the fact that I don't know, like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having I've been having like an existential crisis, an ongoing one, because every time you turn on the news, it's like we're talking about these ridiculous things that are happening. And nobody's like, hey, wait a minute. This is insane. This is like <laughs> you, you can know, only say yeah, that so many times before. Right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> there is yeah. this. It's it's actually quite interesting how, how uh, you, just with re repetition, your yep. standards change. Your expectations mm -hmm. change. I wonder, Greg, if part of the reason you see news as entertainment is a cultural difference. You know, in the United States, the notion of a fourth estate, 
mm -hmm. uh, as a almost a loyal opposition to to you know to speak truth to power mm -hmm. to afflict the afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted that's something that we it's certainly i don't know is it unique to the united states i don't get the sense that the british oh, fresh no, barons have that same attitude don't get me wrong i'm not saying that that's not valuable or useful but i think it's that, immensely valuable i just wonder if that's something yes. that's in your cultural no it's certainly in my culture so it's, i think it's fairly universal across the world okay good but it's also a fallacy to believe that that's inherently valuable in its own right. People used to read the newspapers because that was the only form of entertainment you could get on Saturday morning for right, two bucks. Right. Yeah, right? you read it with your and breakfast. Yeah, no, I understand. And it was delivered to your door, and it was geographically relevant to you, hopefully. It was, you know, usually focused. But the, but the best journalism, uh, maybe despite that, but the best journalists yeah. and the best journalism always had in mind, uh, we are here, like the courts in the United States, you know, we're the, the fourth branch of government. That's what the fourth estate means. We're here to make sure that those other guys stay on the up and up. And that's a not the only function, but it's a big function. Not, but the, the, a lot you take away a off, free right? press, not, you've got, so we, you're really in trouble. There's no other way to... How would you find out what's going on if you didn't have people trying to f dig into it? Exactly. But it's no longer only journalists can, can do that. It's now anybody. Really? With freedom of information and availability of information on the internet, anybody can dig into that. Whereas in the past, even knowing how to make a freedom of information request, which government department, what office, right. how do you fill out the form, that was an impossible no, task. No, for uh, and so I would say that's a broadening of journalism rather than a diminution of the value of journalism. That just means no, those people are same. becoming journalists too. It's the same as what the internet has done to every yes, other business. Precisely. It's cut the middleman out. Precisely. Do we need the journalist to be the middleman anymore? And in fact, part well, of well, but then you get a cacophony of voices with a very with a huge variety of uh, ethical yeah, <laughs> and expertise right. levels. Ex and expertise yeah. and, expertise and expertise ethics. Level, yeah. And so and that's yep. why you're in this fake news crisis because on the internet everything looks equal. And right. uh, and so if you don't have you know, uh, well, this is the journal of records. So this, you know, there's some, there's fact checkers, there's some reputational cost, you know, there's some mm -hmm. burden on this to try to find the truth. Whereas this guy in a blog, you know, it, who is, it could be Alex Jones. We don't know. So, don't know. but my blog has to compete with newspapers. So I have a blog, you know, I post it right. reasonably regularly, but my blog has to compete with newspapers and Snapchat and Facebook live. And no, it's Instagram much more difficult photo. than it used to be. That's right. It's not that people but are inherently. If not there's a fake in news crisis, it's because we no longer can distinguish between truth and fiction. There's nothing. There's and no, I, there's I no would, big red button on there that says this is true. And extrapolate that out, right? Extrapolate that further. It, we have so much false advertising, so many gross lies told to us in advertising. It's very easy to sit there and say, in all the forms of media, and like even the newspaper themselves are full of advertising, which is blatantly overstated or exaggerated or flat out untruthful, right? So you put the news, this thing that you just said about the fourth estate, and you just put it right next to an advertisement, which is a blatant lie. Who's losing here? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, right? all right, let's take it out of the realm of politics. Let's talk about medical information. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it used to be you would go to your doctor. Your doctor would be the trusted source for, for you know, medical mm -hmm. information. And that sure. clearly had flaws uh, and it, it disempowered the patient, et cetera, et cetera. Now, thanks to the Internet, we can get a lot more information. Uh, you know, people, there's a huge amount of information out there, and there's absolutely no way to vet it. And, uh, and, and th if there's a fake news crisis in politics, there's a fake news crisis in diet and health information. Sure, wellness is like a big huge. industry now. Like wellness, let's make it about huge. wellness. What, is that, what does that even mean? And, does mean? and and I would argue, yeah, you know, you, as it means the Paltrow, FDA is not involved. When is Paltrow involved? selling jade <laughs> eggs that you like Wellness the ladies are supposed means. to buy? For, for but the FDA, part. thanks to Congress. Uh, the FDA doesn't weigh in on most of what people consider wellness information. Sure. It's mm -hmm. very, you know, they don't even talk about diet supplements. But it's very let alone jade eggs same, a very or same magnetic way. Like very bracelets same way. or vaccines. And mm -hmm. so we're we're in now in this very similar situation. With health, where uh, and wellness, where there's just it's uh, fake well, news is just everything. as big a problem. Everything, there's so much, there's so much of everything, everything. and there are 
There, there's a sucker born every minute, and there's also a person designed to take advantage of that it's sucker born every minute. It's good news for the and con it, men of the world because it's gotten easier right. than ever. Yes. Yes. And, that, I mean, wellness basically comes down to non-regulated pseudo-medical products that you can self-medicate safely enough, right? <laughs> so the FDA doesn't regulate vitamin supplements right. or whatever. Well, but, I mean, so, there's a whole – there is a massive business in homeopathic remedies. Yes. <laughs> Let and, me just. If let any me just of you use own. homeopathic remedies, I apologize, but it's <laughs> garbage science. Yeah. There's, it's 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 a it's sugar pills. It's you literally can't even. You can't use the word science in there. It's just garbage. It's garbage. It's garbage. It it's takes advantage of people. Uh, there and it and it's and and it drains their pocketbooks with no effect. In fact, the only the benign, the benign effect is there's no there's no effect. At least it's mm -hmm. not going to kill you. Uh, right. And and probably because of the placebo effect, it might even do you some good. But there is nothing regulating it. No. Yeah. You go to you go to the drugstore. There's more homeopathic stuff on the drugstore shelves than there is FDA approved stuff. Right. And stuff. I, I once had a homeopathic primary care physician. I didn't realize he was a homeopathic doctor before I signed up. And uh, yeah, the dude was completely. But he didn't hurt you. <laughs> didn't hurt me, but never You're really helped. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but didn't really help. Didn't really help. Exactly right. So I, I feel like I, I, I feel bad for us because mm -hmm. all one of the look as bad as all of those institutions were the keepers of the flame of truth. You know, we've learned that they, you know, they were, you know, corrupt or they were. At least we. <laughs> had some idea of, uh, uh, you know, we were able to, they they helped us rate the quality of the information we're getting. Mm -hmm. At this right. point, anybody growing up today is, is there's an avalanche of information of all of equal merit. There's, n right. it's very difficult. And, and it, unfortunately, a lot of the fixes for fake news people promote are, well, we have to learn critical thinking and we should teach people how to follow the links and find the, no, it doesn't work. No. What do you do? Well, it's, it's because humans are like we're inherently flawed in the way our belief structures are built up sometimes. So you'll find people, you know, on every side of the political spectrum believing weird stuff. The, a lot of the anti-vaxxers are well, like. Well, that's why I want to take it out of politics. Stuff like yeah, that I want too. to take yeah. it out of politics because that's such a loaded thing. But, yeah. but but there are plenty of it. I mean, it's universal. It's universal. Yeah. Like we will believe like that's it's. The problem is that humans are like, yeah, we will believe things. We're going back to the dark ages when you you'll ignore you, facts. You figured out a person was a witch because you weighed them if, against a duck and the duck <laughs> floated. So if they weigh the same as a duck, they're a witch. <laughs> what? Yeah, we're that's, back that's there. Exactly the we're exactly, we're right way back to Juicero Jesus. Uh, yes. yep. made yep. the, <laughs> he, 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 you know, the Juicero Juices things is exactly this cognitive bias issue that we're talking now about. Now, I uh, now uh, so one of our hosts apparently knows the guy uh, and says he is a sweet, uh, honest, good person, and that the Juicero is not, uh, uh, you know, wasn't an attempt to con people. He really wanted to reinvent. Uh, you know the 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 food system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to assume. Uh, in fact, it, it, it's probably the case that this guy's big mistake was he made it. He he made a squeezer that was really way over the top too good, and he has to charge 400 bucks for it. Look how over designed this thing is. Right. And all it's doing is squeezing a pre juiced bag of stuff <laughs> that you can yeah. do a better job with your hand. Right. Uh, but it's not his. It's not like he was trying to con people. He had this really this this great intention. Sometimes you overthink things. It's like doing. Uh, it's like you have, you're looking at a puzzle in uh, Seventh Guest in the '90s. It's like you know you're looking <laughs> at it for a million hours, and you just feel like an idiot when you figure it out because it's the simplest thing in the world. It's yeah. the same. But the, the bigger worry is that all these investors, all these supposed like technical technology experts, looked at this thing and weren't like. This is too expensive. Why is it so expensive? Can we drop these costs down? And nobody just grabbed the pouch and tried to squeeze it, you know, before. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was no. Like, yeah, this this is, like, there they was raised. No... He raised over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. It was like four hundred. And nobody know, thought to be like, hey, man, could I just like see that packet for a second? Yeah. Squeeze mm. it. <laughs> I, test the theory. Hard. So I think you need to stop focusing on the machine and focus on the fact that they build an entire supply chain here. 
Yep. So you have to have a, a mechanism that produces fresh vegetables uh, and fruits that are then chopped and then put into these bags and then you have to refrigerate them and you have to freight them. to. So I suspect a lot of that 100 million wasn't poured into the machine. There's a back end in here. And each one of these, and this is where, I mean, this is all patently stupid, but let's just go with it for a minute. Well, but that's the point uh, is that they, they saw, they were, yeah. that fooled them. Uh, oh, you got to create yeah. a supply chain. And instead it. of them saying, so is somebody going to pay four hundred dollars for the juicer and then subscribe and then, for what is it? Thirty? Uh, how much a month? Hundred dollars a month. Hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Is that a business? That's what they should have been thinking. Not oh yeah. wow, you know, supply chain. Blah, 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 blah. But that's the problem with Silicon Valley. But they, for the people who yeah. believe that juice is good for you, which is you know, let's leave that to one side. Veggie <laughs> um, <laughs> juices. Yeah. You know, Arguably, by the way, right? Alphabet put money in. They raised $120 million. Yep. Alphabet. Kleiner yep. Perkins put money into this. So remember what we said about millionaires like to fly their own planes and billionaires have yachts? That's exactly <laughs> the sort of person who'd believe in this product, right? Yep. Because that's a product they want. Yeah. It's it's not a product that ordinary people are going to buy. It's not a product that yeah. the majority of the population. It's not a scale product. Not a product no. for scale. I it's a product like, I still, for over like the supply chain and everything. I don't fundamentally see how this is different from setting up like auto delivery of fresh level right. like good juice, a good juice brand yes. to your house or to your office. They didn't fundamentally solve anything. So I'm just sitting here looking at they this like solve anything. dumbfounded. Yeah. It's like, easy yeah. for us in hindsight, Hilarious. especially after seeing the videos of somebody hand squeezing the bag. It's easy for us in hindsight to say, Oh, what what were they thinking? Um, no, there, there were a lot of people before being like, this is the dumbest thing ever. And <laughs> not Gwyneth so not, Paltrow. She loved hindsight. it. Yeah. Hey, yeah, it's going to be on Goop, guys. And if it's Goop, you know it's good. If it's Goop, it's, is that her business, Goop? Goop. Yeah, that's her uh, her, her wellness you know, brand. I, her I think she's style. a wonderful actor. I love her work. Uh, she's not great at names. What are her kids named? Apple? Apple and uh, Moses. <laughs> Apple and and Moses. her company is Goop. Well, it's very well. It's very religious. Apple and Moses, uh, but but Goop. I like. Yeah, I don't. I, have, mm, I don't know. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, all you have to say in the elevator. Look, look what you say in the elevator know. pitch is: We're going to do the Keurig of juice. Yep. Yeah, and people go, "I'm in." I got to write a check. <laughs> Who would if you'd come to some? Uh, look, making coffee too complicated. We're going to make these pods. And, the, and we have a thing. It punches a hole in the... Of course, the thing that punches the hole in the pods and then puts hot water through it is like 80 bucks. Not no, it's cheaper. Like, that it's got cheap. cheaper. It's a piece That's of like plastic. It's like 50 bucks now. Right. They get, they're getting... Yeah, they're big plastic water reservoirs. That's all they are. Yeah. But they they were... They started out a little expensive, but they got cheaper. Yeah. I don't and think the, the juice are is getting reasonable. cheaper. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's I terrible find it, for it's the It's insane, those things. The, the Nespresso version of that is now so popular in the UK... That the government has forced them to start a recycling program. Yeah, rightly so. <laughs> because I mean, yeah, every cup of coffee, them, right? They're made out of aluminium and coffee beans, but because it's you can't put the coffee beans into the compost. Or right, we have a. I assume most people have a compost service, and uh, and you want to recycle the cure the the cup thing, which is pure aluminium, but you can't. So now they're talking about getting them, yeah, blah, blah, blah. At, at least that was solving a problem, right? Like doing coffee, right? Uh, getting fresh beans and everything and yeah. like having a fresh grinding and everything. Yeah. Doing all that right is kind of tough. So having a way to simplify that is yeah. great. We uh, live in a country where people think, juice? we live in a country where know. people think Dunkin' Donuts is good coffee. Hey I now, know, I d Leo. Don't, don't, <laughs> got really I, grew, sad. I grew up in New England. Not really Let's sad. not do this. Don't get me okay. started on U.S. coffee. It's, it's. <laughs> That's not coffee. Not That's excrement <laughs> in a cup with water. I'm sorry. Uh, the show today, yeah. let me talk about it. In the nicest possible way. <laughs> That's Greg Farrow. Write to him at packetpushers.net. Ashley Esqueta. Yes, we die here. Esqueta. Ashley Esqueta. Yeah, that's it. He's, he's got it. There's no, it's a D. I didn't know this. I thought it was a TH, so it's Ashley Esqueta. Yeah, it's Esqueta. a Skeva, but then, Esqueta. yeah, that D-A at the end trips people up, but it just sounds like the Esqueta. word the at the end. It's, it's mm. really weird. So I've been saying it wrong again. Ashley Esketha. Esketha. Yeah. See, yeah, the yeah. problem is I look at how it's spelled, and that's the problem. I shouldn't look at how it's spelled. I should think in my yeah. mind. Ashley, E-S-K-E-T-H-A. Esketha. Now it's Esketha. easy. Esketha. Yeah. Is that, it's like, is that Castilian Spanish? Si, si. Si. Castiliano. It's a ba Basque. 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 Oh, it's Basque. Even better. Basque. Basque is great. Yeah. Also exactly. uh, with us, Devendra Hardawar. You know, his name, it's just like it's spelled. 
just like it's <laughs> that hot for a while. Ha, Although ha, people, ha. Uh, you know, will mistake all the time. And my last name is so close to hardware that I almost <laughs> wish it was pronounced that. Well, you that do, would make you do right for a gadget. It would be better. Yeah. Devendra Hardware. Yeah. That should have, be your, you brand. should have a very special blog that's just called <laughs> Devendra Hardware. Hard, hardware on Hardware. 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 Ooh, yeah, I, like yeah it. I love it. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're moving you off Etsy. into this. You're going to be a brand. That's the new goop. Brand. The new goop. And we're going to get the you the goop. chair. Oh, man. I look. I look at people. People like Marcus Brownlee, who's basically just taking off. Yeah, crushing it. Crushing it, and it's just yep. all. It's one guy and a camera. Well, the, the, the thing is, is like guys like that are never going to come work for right me. Places mm -hmm. like I CNN tried. To, and I tried to hire him for a long one, time. Like, <laughs> we can't. You, you can't. We can't afford a guy like that because he's just killing it. He's just making a huge right. amount of money. And right. the other thing is, is like. Why does he want to I work would imagine for he'd he's he's an influencer. He he mm -hmm. accepts money for appearances and things like that. And that's something that, you know, we we are not really allowed to do. Right. But yeah. but see, there you go. There's an example of why it's so hard to know who to trust. Now I'm sure, now, I, I'm sure Marcus has very high uh, ideals and integrity. Absolutely. So I'm not gonna say anything. But there's plenty of other bloggers out there where you don't know where their money's coming from. They do take right. money from the companies. There's they're a reviewing. very big gray area there, and but you know, and th there are people who watch their channels and um and and implicitly trust them right. without knowing uh, where a lot of their income comes from, and yeah. and you know, and and they get a lot of free gear and things like right. that, and so it's it's very much it's no, a really interesting time in new media. I think yeah. it doesn't it, what. It doesn't last long if you're not if you don't have integrity or ethics in this area. People learn. It, you will very quickly be found out, and yeah. people will quickly dip their their um, bull crap meter will go off and go. This person's obviously getting paid somewhere. It doesn't work. You have to absolutely be authentic and genuine. And if you're getting paid, you have to say so. And I know that because guess what my business is? I get paid to appear at events. Uh, I get paid to fly to conferences. Um, we do all of our shows are sponsored, and the way that we do it is we just tell our audience this is sponsored, and you right. have to be genuine and authentic all the way up. And the minute that you're not is the day that you'll be you'll lose everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really a challenge, yeah. it's a, and it's changed so much, especially now. That, I mean, we 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 do ads. I have to do ads, uh, sure. and so we have to be very careful about a letting you know this is an ad, and b when we talk about a product that we advertise. We've become very religious about disclaiming it immediately and saying, you know, this is, by the way, this is an advertiser. Uh, because we're always trying to make sure that that, that, that distinction is very clear. Right. Uh, and but the in the age of new media where all of these people are, uh, where all of these influencers and YouTubers and things are coming up in the world, uh, you know, if you're care. not... If you're care. not cross-promoting, you're dying. Right. I mean, like, if you're not on 500 different right. of your, you know, fellow YouTuber channels, that's right. like, you're, you're dead in the water. And so... How do you mm. how do you compete with that? That's it's a really interesting question. It's I, like it's well, something I think I think about it market. a lot. Right. That's the mass consumer market where uh, you need to appeal to very large numbers of people. So somebody like Casey Neistat, six thousand six million subscribers, he needs to have uh, produce a product which appeals to the largest audience because his monetization is very small. Whereas my business works on monetization of a very small audience that's worth a very large amount of money to a very small number of clients. So I can build a perfectly viable business model. So you need to be careful about saying, generalizing what you're seeing, you're talking about mass consumer markets, but there are vertical markets where you can run very specific businesses that are very um, excellent places to work like ours, right? Where we only need to attract an audience of 30 or 40,000 people who have a total spending of roughly in the order of two to $3 billion a year. Whoa, I take those people. <laughs> right, and if you can influence them, yeah. you've got a viable business that's, that's model. That's a good so, niche. Yes. Right. So you, there's a gap between, you know, five hundred thousand subscribers, ten thousand. You have a business activities that you need to do. So if you want to reach that audience, yes, you need to cross promote. You need to get exposure because the attrition rate, people signing off from your YouTube channel as opposed to staying with you, is very high. So you need to continually get the churn going. But and I don't so, think Casey Neistat, somebody like a Casey Neistat, is not is not making broad videos for monetization because he is sponsored by Samsung. Like that's, I mean, you hit a certain point where monetization is a Wouldn't very that small kill, part and, of and, 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 uh, Marcus Brownlee is a good example. If Marcus Brownlee started being sponsored by Samsung, that would kind of kill his credibility. Do you think so? Like, I don't know. Because I, I think a lot of his 
I think a lot of his viewers might feel that they could trust him with some a sponsorship like that. Because like, even okay, though he's well, sponsored, if you're making money off of that, say, I know I'm sponsored by them, but I'm going to be honest about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm maybe. I'm upfront about yeah. it. Here it is, yeah. and I think that I think that that's um, that and is. I, I and I mean I'm talking about this not as a generalization, Greg. I, I'm talking about it in the sense of a as entertainers. Like these are these are people who are entertainers who are who are bringing you information. Um, and mm. you know whether it doesn't matter what vertical it's in, it, but it's it's very much um, yeah. You absolutely can uh, even in the music industry. It's the same thing. If you can build super fans with, who have a lot of uh, yep. spending prowess then you only need a few of them to, to sustain you. And you also have to decide what your idea of success is. Um, mm. But I just, I mean, in the sense of like uh, tech journalism, I mean, just in general is like the thing that I am familiar with because that's what I work in. And that's sort of the the push and pull of, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of talent uh, at, at YouTube or, you know, doing their own thing and creating their own brand, really hesitant to join a, a larger corporation because of, limitations yeah mm -hmm. yeah but that that medium is not is no you cannot i don't believe that you can transfer from youtube to a corporation the corporation is effectively the death of the independent creator because it starts to apply rules as soon as somebody owns your salary and they can start to dictate the way that you work and sometimes it's overt and sometimes it's um subvert right. and mm -hmm. and it well, all that's what i'm saying in. they're not they're very right. wary about going to corporations because they've built sure. this thing and they don't but have to. The thing is they don't they need for YouTube, corporations. Like to be clear, like yeah. Yeah. all the ad they're, money. They're working like, on YouTube's farm, you bet. We were just talking about the affiliate stuff, like yeah. ad rates drop, YouTube kicks you off for whatever right. reason. Right. Like it's 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 funny how it's like independent, but not quite. You're independent on somebody else's platform, you know? Sure. Hey, let's take a break. More to come. Great panel. Uh, we had a great week this week and I'd like to, I wanted to show you this little video that we made Highlighting the week. Watch. Previously on Twit. Might look like I was on vacation on my face. No, that is VR goggles. It's like maybe a little sunburn, but no, it's yeah. just maybe you need nerd to loosen burn. The, yeah, nerd, 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 that's what it is. You need to loosen the straps, I think, a little bit. Triangulation. We're talking with Cory Doctorow, his news book, Walk Away. A lot of it is about what happens when people who have very strong political beliefs start to compromise on them and how compromise can slide you from you know, don't be evil to surveillance capitalism in a bunch of very small steps. Security now. This is a bad idea. Uh-oh. MasterCard unveils next generation biometric card. But a thumbprint is not exact. Yes, it's better than nothing. But if we look at the technology that had to be employed, it is. it doesn't mean that this is cryptographically secure. Know how. We're making a Raspberry Pi elect. Tell me about the weather. In Santa Rosa, there's a flood warning in effect until Friday. We're going to be using the uh, Amazon yes. trigger word a lot. So when you hear bleeps, it's, it's not us saying elect, not us saying. <laughs> this is your brain. This is your brain on Twit. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know. A priest swearing always cracks me up. I just that's that's really I, that's actually a really good idea. Just bleep it out. Like we do. That's great. We do. Great. But but of course, a lot of people watch live, and those are the people who uh, who, who get Ugh, who get the I'm burden. So yeah. Did you guys see the the new voice tech Amazon added in for devs? Um, the whispering, so the, right? The personality yeah, the whispering stuff. and the shouting, and it, they can bleep themselves too. So that's going to be kind of cool. Is that a? Right. Can I play a sample of that anywhere? Is there? Is I don't it, think it's working yet. It was I, just like a dev. It's document an API for developers, right? Like they're saying yeah. they're opening up a so API. So she will whisper and yell. She will whisper some too. Personality, yeah. 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 So I listen, like, like a password. Valve, your password is. Pss, 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 pss. Oh man. Yeah, Valve. If you're listening, I just want to let you know that I would pay a very high <laughs> price to have a Gladys voice pack from Portal. <gasps> I had on uh, Tom Tom. You know, Tom Tom let you do celebrity yeah. voices. I had Glados. Oh. But she lied. She, when you were, <laughs> well, that's what you expect. I know. That's when you were does. supposed to turn yeah. right, she'd say, "Turn left here," and then yeah. when you'd get there, she'd say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you've arrived. There's no cake." It was awesome. He's the best. <laughs> Your destination was a lie. Your yeah. destination best was a lie. Ever like she's really. Oh, oh, I miss her, man. That's the that's the virtual assistant I want. Like I would pay any price. So you want Glados? I want Scarlett Johansson. Uh, well, yeah, so from you. her, yeah. you'd have it. Yeah, from that'd her. be really nice. Yeah. Until she, was, she leaves you she for the singularity. Really nice right. voice. Like I, she she's was very so soothing cute. to me. She was very cute. soothing. She has a cute voice, right? It was just like pleasant, and 
Like you just thought she's adorable. You feel like you you feel like she's your friend. Like her voice really is very friendly. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I get it. That's because you're a girl. I thought more than that. I thought. Well, of course. I mean, yeah. Obviously, I know why the dudes like Scarlett Johansson's voice. (laughs) She's cute. (laughs) She's adorable. You just like to get to know her better. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll never forget when my father-in-law said that about the Victoria's Secret catalog. They just seem like girls you just like to get to know. <laughs> seem like better. nice girls. Nice girls. Like real nice yeah. girls. Nice. They just seem like nice. Nice girls. ladies. They're yeah. nice ladies. Nice ladies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot to mention we got a great week uh, coming up. Let's take a look at what's the week. Uh, what's? <laughs> oh, no, I'm all thrown now thinking about that. Uh, what's ahead this week, Jason? How, Jason? Here's a look at just a few of the stories we'll be watching in the week ahead. On Monday, May 1st, Apple is dropping the commissions it pays for apps and in-app content as part of the iTunes affiliate program from 7% down to 2.5%. Other content types will stay at 7% in all markets. On Tuesday, May 2nd, Microsoft is holding an event in New York City where it's expected to focus on education and creativity, though the rumor mill is still uncertain whether you can expect an updated Surface tablet, so cross your fingers on that one. On Wednesday, May 3rd, a judge decides whether to issue an injunction against Uber in Waymo's case that alleges the theft of 14,000 documents used by Uber in developing its LiDAR technology, which could temporarily halt Uber's self-driving car pilot program until the suit is decided. And finally, earnings mayhem continues with Apple on Tuesday, May 2nd and Facebook on Wednesday, May 3rd. That's a look at a few of the things we'll be tracking in the coming week. Join Megan Maroney and me on Tech News Today every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern here on twit.tv. Thank you, Jason. And our live Mystery Science Theater 3000 type coverage of the Microsoft event will be begin at 6 a.m. Pacific time, oh. 9, <laughs> 9 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, uh, and it's me and Ed Bott, right, uh, will be joining me uh, We'll be consuming mass quantities of uh, coffee. When is that? Wednesday? Or Tuesday? It's Tuesday, isn't it? Tuesday, 6 a.m. Pacific, Tuesday. 9 a.m. Eastern uh, on uh, twit.tv. You can join us live. Our show today brought to you by, here's another example of Silicon Valley kind of taking it and running with the ball. And it's and it's done such a great job. And Blue Apron, now the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Who knew? Turned out people really like the idea of instead of going to the grocery, you know, planning a meal, going to the grocery store, buying the ingredients, bringing them home and cooking them, just coming home and finding a box, a lovely refrigerated box on the doorstep with everything they need to make an incredible meal for dinner. You could, They have two plans, one for couples and one for families of four. You could do it all yourself. You never have more uh, of the ingredients than you need. So if you need like a teaspoon of soy sauce, you get a little bottle with a teaspoon of soy sauce, which is nice because you don't, there's the waste, there's no waste afterwards. But you And you may get great leftovers because I have to say they're fairly generous in the portions. These are delicious meals. You cook them in 40 minutes or less. You get the recipe card. And it really is a great way of kind of expanding your repertoire. That's what I think of it as. Because, I, you know, when I cook, I cook kind of the same five or six meals all the time. Uh, and it's nice to have something new, new ingredients, new styles. By the way, ingredients, amazing, fresh, high quality from 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers. Across the United States, the meat is always fresh. The fish is always fresh, never frozen. The box is refrigerated. It comes, you know, just in the nick of time, and you just make it. It's still incredible. Their freshness guarantee promises every ingredient in your delivery arrives perfectly ready to cook, or they're going to make it right. Blue Apron, they deliver to 99% of the continental United States. There's no weekly commitment. It's not a subscription. You just get deliveries when you want them. You can customize your menus every week. You just go online, say, I want this, this, and this. Match your dietary needs. They have vegetarian plans as well. And recipes never get repeated within a year, so you never get bored. Look at that. What was that? Go back to that. I want that. Roasted pork and mustard pan sauce with asparagus and fingerling potatoes. Oh, my gosh. Thing is, once you make that mustard sauce, then you know, oh, I, ooh, that's good. It's easy. I'm going to use that 15 different ways. It really expands your capabilities. And my mouth is watering like crazy. Spinach and fresh mozzarella pizza with olives, pep bell peppers, and ricotta salada. Or sweet and sour salmon with bok choy, carrot, and ginger fried rice. Look at these. It just looks... So I'm so hungry. I know. It's so, so mean. So hungry. So mean. They make that me do this. That spinach and egg flatbread thing, that pizza looks... Doesn't that ridiculous. look good? I want to eat it. Have you ever That's tried awesome. this, Ashley? You really should. You would love it. I've tried. I, yeah, uh, we have had Blue Apron for a while. Like oh. we, we like it. 
So I do um, too. we I think we split between that and uh, another and another one. delivery one. It's yeah. Not so but the other um one, but yeah. yeah, no, no, but but we you know, it's funny you mentioned like doing uh doing blue apron we actually became a little bit more adventurous in exactly. sort of putting together our own stuff later like exactly. <laughs> we were just like okay so we can only get this three times a week for dinner so how do we right. help ourselves the rest of the week yeah check out this week's <laughs> menu pick the ones you want get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping it's at blueapron.com slash twit we've been using this for i don't know almost a year now and i just i love it blueapron.com slash Twit and yes, it makes me hungry every time I do that ad. Ashley, is, it is, looks a lot more organized than me just going to the cupboard and working out what's in there. <laughs> it is, and you always yeah. make something because you've got I the ingredients. Like. Yeah, I always like that thing about um, like I don't make a lot of Indian food, but I love it. Right. And um, and I don't have like there are sometimes like I can't get specialty ingredients, or you know, it takes a long time to kind of put them together and to be able to just get them, like and not have to spend you know, especially with some of these kind of more expensive spices. It's like 20 bucks for a bottle that's this Saffron. big and you're, you need yeah. to use a quarter of a teaspoon and it's like, then you never use it again. So I like uh, Blue Apron for that reason. That's like really nice. Twitter We're also- beating on the top Oops, and stop it. Line and I hate autoplay video. Gosh, <laughs> darn. You know, it's funny. I had it turned off. I had a, a plug-in and everything that did it and then Google changed how it does it. And they're playing <gasps> again. Makes me it's because so. somebody, the person who changed it, watches Twit. They, they, they knew. Drive me mad. <laughs> drive like, I'll me show you, mad. Leo. Uh, Twitter earnings: eleven cents a share versus one cent expected. Yikes. Talk about a Trump bump. Uh, revenue was five hundred forty-eight million dollars, but un better than expected. Still declining. Monthly active users. You know, it sounds like a lot. Three hundred twenty-eight million, and that's. Not but it's a fraction of, of course, what Instagram. Instagram is almost at a billion. Facebook, of course, almost at two billion. Yeah. But still, that's three hundred twenty-eight million. And a lot of them are bots. That's you gotta yeah. also consider bots and people who Spammers, have signed in and and or, or people who have signed in, grabbed, parked their at and. Well, these are active users. This is it. monthly active users, so they have to use it at least once okay. a month. So bots is a, I mean, yeah. that's like a good percentage. Is bots people who have you know like businesses that auto tweet things like that. Twitter said like the daily really daily usage accelerated uh, 14, up 14 percent. But see, Ashley, you just told me all you need to do is send people into my Twitter account. I mean, it's still a very important mm. medium. Yeah. I, I mean, that's my main way of people getting a hold of me yeah. was on social mm. media is that uh, that that is it. Twitter is the big one. Oh, hello, dog. I, <laughs> I think it's ultimately it gets down to the difference between multicast versus in-cast. So uh, mechanisms like Facebook chat and Snapchat and WhatsApp and all Instagram um, are all about communicating to your friends or to people that you know and that you met, maybe less so with Instagram. But um, so there, but Twitter is one of the few, maybe just Instagram is the only other one where you can send something to people that you never know, where you can broadcast a social media update. And I can't help shake the feeling that there's a different business model between the way that Facebook runs its chat apps and exploits them for revenue and to the way where if you're broadcasting something to into the open, which is, and you, you just, there's just not that much money in that. And maybe Twitter has to accept that the, the basis of this business model is that there's a fundamental revenue shift between if uh, Facebook can exploit your private data because you're presenting, you're only talking to your friends. So you're, they can get many more signals to exploit advertising signals, whereas what you say on Twitter is not so easily monetized because what you're mm -hmm. presenting there is a different sort of persona. So it's yeah, you know what? You make a good case. I you know I, I'm tempted to blame management that they've just never managed to take something that is so critical, you know, to yeah. our culture and make money at it. But you might be right. That's the very nature of it. That sure they're selling ads and they mm -hmm. made you know they had revenue of half a billion dollars in three months. Uh, maybe I cut costs would be the first thing I would say. Why is yeah. it why is it costing so much money if you can't make money at half a billion dollars a a, a quarter? Yeah. Uh, but and at the same time, they don't have the opportunities. Deals. Go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. Devendra. Yeah. No, we're there. We're seeing more licensing too. Like Twitter data is appearing everywhere now, and they're making big deals with you know uh, what sports um, leagues and everything. So it's like there's a lot of stuff happening. But I guess making money is a bigger thing. Personally, like I'd pay a little money for 
better better Twitter apps and more control. You're not and, alone. And a number of people yeah, lately have suggested too. let's do a pay let's do it paid Twitter. Mm -hmm. Why just a you, pro version would be nice, like with more yeah. tools and more. Well, they are. Aren't they? T aren't I'm a they power toying? user. They're they're experimenting with a paid version of TweetDeck. I think. I think I heard that right. I don't I, want. I those. hope it's a complete rewrite because yeah, TweetDeck yeah, is useless. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I use I'm it with still, but it could be so much better, I guess. <laughs> it's good, but yeah, it's it's. I use it because I have oh, to, man. and I wish like for mm. such an essential service that their tools were better. Yeah. Read How much it, would you yeah. pay for a, a Twitter account? A, a, and what would you have to get? I would pay five bucks a month just to have it. Yeah, I'd pay five to ten bucks a month, I think, like five depending on what yeah. you get with it. Yeah, um, better filtering, can't make a business. Can't make a business at five to ten bucks a month. It has to really? be 20 to I 50. Know. Yeah, really? Well, you look around you, look at all the startups in Silicon Valley, they're all 20 bucks a month plus, And they, the race that they have is to get enough value to justify 20 bucks a month. Right. But well, are, uh, are those I mean, companies not, also Netflix, doing all of these licensing Hulu, deals stuff, yeah. and all of these other things? Mm -hmm. I mean, as a power user, just to be able to pay a little extra for the same service uh, mm -hmm. with just a few extra tools that are key to how I use it and how other people who use Twitter a lot. Um, I don't know. I mean, if they're still making money in the ways that they're doing it right now, maybe that's maybe. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It costs a lot of money to collect money, right? And at five bucks a mm -hmm. month, you're making nothing because the cost, cost of the back end transaction is three bucks. So and then you're left with two bucks a month, and now you've got to build an entire infrastructure and back end to collect two bucks a month. That doesn't work. Um, so even oh, well, if you reach screwed. a percent, screwed because nobody's yes. going to pay twenty bucks a month for Twitter. It's definitely got to be ten to ten to twenty bucks a month 10, because of the you way. Do see, I mean, look, changes. Netflix is around ten. I'd pay I mean, ten. Yeah. I'd pay ten uh, bucks a month for Twitter if I had the right tools. I'd pay ten. Tune bucks. in internet radio. I just bought. I didn't want to buy it, mm -hmm. but it's the only way you can. You know, there's there's certain limitations, but you get books. You get a radio station. That's a hundred bucks a year. A hundred bucks a year seems to be the yeah. new normal, That's your right? Yeah. It, At a hundred bucks a year, you can do a transaction where you you lose five bucks. In transaction fees, you need about 10 to 15 bucks to run the back end. So to have an accounting system, customer database, securing that. And now you've got 80 bucks a year to do something out of your business. So let's just say you're going to take, uh, you're going to have to take 20%. You're probably going to end up with about 30 bucks that you can use to produce something valuable to justify the 100 bucks for existing. Well, that's the the beauty of Twitter's model. They don't have to produce anything. <laughs> Their users mm -hmm. produce the content. That's on my point is see the thing is to, to to make to you have to charge 100 bucks to create something that's worth 30 bucks that you've mm -hmm. got to convince people to buy 100 bucks for. Right. Right? Right. So, if you're Twitter, how I do you I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. See so because by the time all the costs of the people and the overheads and the administration and the legals and blah, 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 and international currency transactions and all that stuff, right? You're left with usually about one third of the money that comes in through the door. So what are you going to produce for 30 bucks that people will pay 100 a bucks year. for? 30 bucks a, a year. year. And people yes. will pay 100 bucks for it. That's yeah. right. So now let's say you get 10 million people to pay up. So now you've got 300 million. Yeah. What are you going to get? What are you going to create for 300 million to justify right. you 100 bucks a year right yeah so they're screwed well better better engineering like it seems like a big problem with twitter is just they can't get people to fix their crap uh tweet deck yeah. has been a mess on the web forever um yeah I, I understand like this may not be the most financially sound you know decision and won't keep them alive but maybe really doing something for these loyal users who you know really depend on the service as like the lifeline of information what if they build around a, the world, and also are the backbone know, of the service the people yeah. who put yeah. up all right. of that information and, and and like memes and the things that break all the time those are power users right. like almost mm -hmm. always and so to to not have tools for them seems like a really good way to get them to finally get fed up with it and be like well, i can't manage this anymore right. i wash my hands of it what if you made like a really good uh, took Twitter and made a really good juicer? Yeah, <laughs> God. like a packet. <laughs> well, I think I, I mean this You're might really lead good. us into a conversation around what Unroll Me did, Leo. Oh like, my God, there's a there, okay. So uh, this is, yes, very interesting point uh, cause because what you're, you're the product, right? When you're right. The, at Twitter, you're the product, not the the customer. The customer is the people who gives Twitter money. That's not us. So last Sunday, there was an interesting article about a profile of Mike Isaac uh, in the New York Times profiled uh, uh, Travis Kalanick, the CEO and founder of Uber. 
By the way, this was a good week for Uber. There were no negative stories after that <laughs> one. After that one. <laughs> <laughs> but in that one, we learned some interesting things. One, that uh, the Uber app had been, and I think we talked, did we talk about this last Sunday? We've been talking about it all week. The Uber app had been carefully crafted uh, to, uh, you know, in violation of Apple's policies, get unique identifiers for every user of the app. And this was actually Uber trying to uh, eliminate fraud on the part of its drivers. Mm -hmm. But Apple says very clearly you cannot get identifying information and keep it. Uh, that would, you know, they were using secret APIs to do that. Apple can do it, but not uh, third party apps. Mm -hmm. Tim Cook, Uber thought, oh, we'll never get caught because we, we've geofenced our app so that it doesn't do this if you're in, if it's in Cupertino. What they forgot is Apple's a kind of a big company. They might have people outside of Cupertino anyway. The Apple figured it out. Tim Cook, un, instead of banning them from the app store, or even like making saying things like, well, all right, but you've got to tell your users. Tim Cook just said, now nah, Travis, don't do that. Dan, you got to stop that now. Knock it off. And Travis <laughs> did. Uh, would have been nice had they uh, said something. But the, that was the only thing we learned in that article. As you a little bit farther down in the article, almost at the bottom of it, we found out that Uber was buying Lyft receipts from a company called Slice. Slice had bought a company called Unroll Me, a company I've recommended and used, mm -hmm. which had a great free service, Unroll.me. What they did is you would sign up, you'd give it your Gmail credentials, and then it would go through and help you unsubscribe to newsletters you didn't want and do a digest of news newsletters you did. Uncluttering your mailbox was a great idea. Turned yeah. out the business model was now we got your email <laughs> and we can sell information that we extract from your email. Like, for instance, how many Lyft rides you took. Now, we'll anonymize that information. But they did sell that to, uh, to Uber. Uber was using it for competitive research. They were trying to figure out how much business Uber was, uh, Lyft was generating. And those were very valuable. A lot of people reading this felt like they'd been, you know, robbed. And Uber, uh, Unroll Me's uh, uh, CEO and founder wrote a blog post to say how heartbroken he was that you found that out. Was not a, that was not a helpful blog. That was not a helpful <laughs> you blog. You found out what he and was I, up wasn't to. Wasn't it so much that the, the, the Unroll Me, the current CEO of Unroll Me, was like, please stop talking. Like, yeah. <laughs> just maybe just don't. Stay <laughs> on the. Mm, mm, mm. Maybe just don't post. Uh, uh, maybe just don't, don't say, post. Yeah. And we can do better and blah, blah, blah. Uh, sure. But your, it sounds like your point, and I think this is well taken, uh, Greg, is that, of course, they were doing this. Mm -hmm. How else would they make this work? <laughs> well, yeah. I think for me, I mean, it's this... not so much that uh, Uber was doing this, but think about how many other data sources Uber's got. So now they've got access to, uh, inverted commas, anonymized information, and we have so mm -hmm. much. It's not um, anonymized, obviously. It's not. Yeah. Anybody yeah. can unanonymize un this data. Right. We've seen that so consistently over the years. Right. So let's let's do away with the fallacy that it was anonymized. That's bull, right? Um, what we have is the data that came from Unroll Me. How many other data sources was Uber buying to get build a competitive profile? Much right. less its own data. So the Uber app tracks you when you're in the car, but it also tracks you for 30 minutes, five minutes after you leave. So mm -hmm. if it's now getting, let's just take the unroll me thing. If it's now seeing your receipts for, say, going into a restaurant and it knows that it took you there, then um, it can say, well, hang on, Uber dropped this person at this place. Here's a receipt for this exact time. Oh I can match God. up this person with their personal right. data. Oh, my God. And so now you have, you can build up a whole profile around somebody. Now, keep in mind that Uber can also go out onto the internet and talk to Verizon and get anonymized data about their people's traffic on the internet and suck that into that data. Yes, platform. that's now completely and so on legal. And so yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not surprised Uber is doing this. I'm, I guess, more surprised that, uh, you know, services like Unroll Me, these things pop up all the time. And there are always like your conspiracy theorist friend who's like, why why are you giving yeah, up right. your data to this Why company? would you put a camera and with Amazon uh, yeah. in your closet? <laughs> exactly. And most people don't pay any attention, but right. then fast forward a couple of months and, oh, my God, they're selling the data. Um, then well, people start of, freaking out and then there's the consumer reaction. I wish we had the earlier stuff, too. Yeah. But it's it's yeah. tough. Yeah. We used to are. say follow the money to find out why something was mm -hmm. being wrong. And increasingly, I find myself following the data collection. Yep. Yeah. And in in Amazon's case, Amazon actually isn't about the money. It's about the data. And Google's in this business and Facebook is in this business. It wants the data. It wants to have mass. It wants your photographs so it can mine them 
your information. It wants your messages. It wants your – it doesn't care about your home address and your mobile phone number anymore. What it wants is the metadata associated with that. It wants to know that your mobile phone was in the back of an Uber and then that you went to this restaurant because that categorizes you as this person, which I can now target for ads. Mm -hmm. And I hate it. All right, let me. All right. <laughs> so we're going to wrap with this, but let me ask one last uh, question. Uh, it's kind of taken as written that, oh, well, this is bad. Oh, you shouldn't let this personal information out. But what, uh, tell me concretely and, and realistically, and a lot of people say, well, then the insurance company buys that and they deny you insurance. No, no, I mean concretely and realistically, what is the harm? I don't mind, assuming that I don't mind targeted ads, I don't mind being offered a coupon when I get out of the Uber to go to the mm -hmm. restaurant next door. Assuming I don't mind that, what is the actual harm? I, I think the big problem is Unroll Me is doing this and just didn't tell anybody. And I'm sure it's probably in the terms of service or something. It is. Maybe but somebody, you know, it is. It up. But yeah. I wish, for me, the harm is just like, yeah, these companies keep doing these things and sneaking it in and not being fully transparent about what's happening. The consumer harm is maybe more stuff like Uber, though, like these lavishly funded companies who can compile all this data and use it to crush their competitors. In a certain sense, it is like helping it's helping to promote unhealthy competition in some markets. OK, I would say unhealthy competition would also be like my answer. I agree with you, Devendra. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that uh, I was having this conversation about the Echo Look this this week, and um, and I think that the next generation uh, coming up grows is growing up in a world where they voluntarily share their yep. days, everything mm -hmm. in their day, with the rest of the internet, and um, and I think that the idea of what pieces of privacy are the most important to them, um, they will have to figure that out for themselves. And I think that we have an evolving um, an evolving world of privacy in which, uh, you know, we kind of have to decide and it's I don't I don't know what the answer to that is, but you have we have to decide uh, how much privacy are we willing to give up for machine learning because it only mm -hmm. gets better with our data. And it's this yep. it's this weird circular so, uh, thing where it's like chicken or egg. It's like, well, it can only be good if you give it your information. But then how much information are you really willing to give it? So then maybe it's a little more limited than it could be and not as convenient. So basically, it's late stage capitalism. We're, you know, we capitalism as a blood sport. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And. Yeah. Uh, this was the kind Hunger of, Games. I think of capitalism. this was kind of inevitable, though. This is kind of the nature sure. of capitalism, sure. isn't it? Well, Absolutely. I think the thing about machine learning is it's it inherently um, rewards the biggest companies. So there is no way to be, have a small machine learning startup because you need the data to train the models to do something useful so that you then have a service that you can sell or a, a revenue stream that you can create. I call it exploit the data, right, which is its correct name. You call it selling it. I call it exploiting. But so inherently to do machine learning, you need to have vast amounts of cash to be able to um, maintain data. So once you've got so the, the data, barrier to entry is huge for new companies yes. to come along. And so you end up with monopolies like Google, Facebook, Alibaba, uh, uh, Netflix with vast amount of data about yeah, what people I mean, are watching. Amazon's building up. In the, in the 18th century, you could also get monopolies by having controlling the shipping lanes. I mean, there's always been it's it, yes. capitalism leads to monopoly. That's the that's, that's right. what happens. That's what late stage capitalism is ultimately is monopolization by yeah. some sort of rob some, robber baron. Some sort of. And the problem is ultimately is that it's not. I, and I agree with, uh, with with your point about we need machine learning to do things to to be cyborgs. We are all cyborgs now. If you're holding a smartphone, you're a cyborg, right? The machine makes you greater than you are. The fact it's not embedded in your body is here or there, right? To me, anyway. The point I would disagree with that, that, but okay, continue. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley and I want it embedded. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, not, yeah. I'm holding out for the metaverse. Yeah. 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 But the point is you're already half a cyborg if you're dependent yeah, on your there. smartphone we're today, right? We're getting there. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, I think the point here is, is that there are uh, there's no control. I can't take this data back. This data is stolen. This data is taken from your digital exhaust from the – you look at Verizon acquired AOL and HuffPo and all those companies and it's going to buy Yahoo just so mm -hmm. that it can build bigger databases so it can target better ads to you and sell that data to other people. It's all an ad tech play. I didn't give permission 
for a lot of that data. And certainly this is where the FCC rollback around net neutrality is starting to be quite concerning. But that data is taken and used in ways which um, I don't control. And if there are unintended consequences or if there are consequences down the line about a decision I made today that affects the rest of my life, I cannot take it back. And that is my problem is I cannot mm-hmm. take back, you know, if I spent five years sharing my life online and everybody can see that, that has consequences for the next 50 years of your life. So or I just long- ignore ads and then uh, my life is fine. <laughs> no, I understand yeah. what you're saying, but I, I feel like it doesn't, it, it is just the way capitalism works. And, and also I feel like that sure the if- next generation of people, that's like, that's an argument that they would answer with. So what? But I, so who cares? Yeah, that's a, yeah. Is, is that, I, I want that's my uh, Amazon. Yeah, I don't look. care. I just say, yeah, I, I want, want my, my Amazon look. to give me the best information yeah. and the best. You know, I just I want care. the best and the most convenient thing. And, and so they're I, willing to I, trade that. I want a merchant that's the most efficient, so I can get the lowest prices. I don't care. Right. Right. And yeah. now your I, merchant I isn't giving, giving you the lowest price. Then you get Walmart. You a variable price. Right. And then so, you get a variable pricing model depending on, you know. But like, can I just say that I feel like if if I make really good money. And somebody else can be subsidized, like someone who doesn't make a lot of money could have access, like a Nintendo Switch. So let's say I pay a little extra for the Switch and somebody else who can't really afford it pays a little bit less, but they get to enjoy it. Like I did that. I, I bought my Switch on eBay that. at a $100 premium because I didn't want to wait in line. Yeah, like variable pricing already happens on sites like eBay where it's like if there's yeah. supply and demand, you're going to – you're People with the funds will pay a and little I was extra. Very people happy. that don't just won't have I it was until thrilled. they can afford it. I could get the switch. <laughs> Except <laughs> that you're assuming that the money that this that you're transferring your wealth to somebody who is worthy of it. Tell I me. I don't how care if they're worthy. Be, Why does we care if they're worthy? Yeah, I don't well, care. Well what if they're happens worthy. if the what happens if the intermediary is just exploiting both sides? Well, they're always gonna exploit both sides. Like, but right. that's the so nihilist. your case then so is, it's like, is false. I'd rather. So I'd the debate rather you're making is you'd be willing to, to pay less. more. So you'd be willing to go and work harder for the rest of your life, uh, you know, and, and earn that, uh, get that pay rise, earn that extra money, and then just give it away because some retailer asked you for it. No, I'm I'm doing it because mm-hmm. they have an option for. It was your example. You said. On the yep. flip side of that, somebody with a lower income could get it at a cheaper price. And if that was the case, I'd be like, all right. The well, problem is the, the, an- the antidotes to this sometimes I worry about, right? It's, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, well, so then what? <laughs> what well, yeah, so, I mean, that's always the question, right, Leo? It's like, so then what? So then what? So then what? Because, yes, I mean, in a way it is, it, it would be a retailer hypothetically taking advantage of a certain group or class of people and then, you know, people fight back against that. People get upset about that. People, you know, want it to be democratized, all the same price. You know, that's fine. Like, I, I get that. Um, but it's like, that's just the evolution of, of what's happening right now. And yeah. I, I think yeah. that mm-hmm. machine learning there's, and the cloud no are the, the biggest, uh, AI is like one of the biggest growing verticals in technology right now because of these things. Hang, hang on to everybody. Hang on to their thoughts. We have one more ad. I want to get that out of the way. And I want to give you a chance final to, to, to sum this up. Cause I think this is really the, this is a fundamental conversation it really is exactly what we do, which is we talk about what's going on today and, and what the impact is going to be in the future and what it's going to mean to you in the future. That's really all we do. Uh, it happens to be all about technology because that's where the, that's where the rubber is hitting the road today. Um, but that's what I think to me the most interesting thing. I'd love to hear from all three of you. But first, a word mm-hmm. from Harry's. I want to talk about uh, another. Almost all the advertisers in this show are disrupting the status quo. Harry's is a perfect example. Two guys, Jeff and Andy, uh, serial entrepreneurs. They were looking for their next thing, and they said, "What is an industry we can disrupt?" They were tired of getting of paying four dollars a blade for their for their razor blades. They said, we could do better. I bet you we could do a, there they are. We could do a razor blade company that charges less and gives you great quality. Uh, and we'll do it by subscription. And they created Harry's and it's amazing. Harry's uh, sells great blades. They, they did one thing that was very smart. They took all that venture capital and they bought the factory that makes the blades in Germany, the best blade making factory in Germany. They own it. So you're buying direct from the factory. So you get good razors, great blades, 
and they cost half as much as the blades in the drugstore. I love it. I just love this idea. Now, uh, there is a monopoly in razor blade companies because they all patent their handles. So Harry's had to make a different handle, and that means you've got to get the handle before you can use the blades, but they've made that very easy, too. Normally, you can get a shave set, which includes the handle, three blades, a full-size bottle of the shave cream or the gel, whichever you choose, the uh, travel blade cover. That's $15. That's the Truman set. They have the Winston set with the metal handle. I really like the Winston. $25. But you know what? We got an even better deal. We're going to get you started with Harry's free. You just cover shipping when you sign up. So what we're going to do, we've got a sample that includes the handle. It's a very, the very nice Truman handle. It's weighted. It's a uh, rubberized grip, so it feels good. We're going to get you a couple of the of the cartridges. These are five-blade cartridges that include the trimmer and the lubricating strip, everything. And, and a sample size of the shave gel, so you can see how that is. Free. Just, you pay the shipping. And then you get the subscription, so you never will run out. You will always have blades, and you won't ever use a blade longer than you should. Uh, it's awesome. I want you to go to harrys.com slash twit. Harrys, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash twit. And, and uh, this, is, this is an awesome deal. We've, we just started to do this. We, you get the free set, just cover shipping. And then, of course, sign up for the subscription. It's a great deal. Get started with Harry's today, and you will be very, very happy. And the nice thing is you never run out. You always, get the you always have blades. You always have shave cream. You're ready. You're ready to go. Harry's.com slash twit. What a great panel today. Greg Farrow from the Packet Pushers Network. It's always a pleasure to have you on. You're so smart. Uh, and, and <laughs> I don't know about that, but anyway. No, you are, and, and I love it. He's ethereal mind on the on Twitter. you got to follow him there. And do listen to all the uh, shows on the Packet Pushers Network. They're really, really great. Devinder Hardwar from Engadget. He's a senior editor there. And uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say he's been a great friend of, of, of uh, personally and of the network for some years now. And it's always great to have you on. And, our, our newest oh, friend, the yeah, our newest friend who's I just uh, have just got a massive crush on now. Ashley Weeks of friendship. Esketha. Weeks of friendship. Yeah, it took me it took me a month to learn her name, but no, I just I love all three of you, and yes. it's always fun to do a show. Last thoughts on this as we as we end as we head off into the sunset of late stage capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> what is the antidote to this? It feels so inevitable. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Um, I think for me, there has to be a social safety net. Now, we can, the, every culture is going to attack a social safety net differently. Let me just sort of say basic like, um, income. Say, yep. Uh, well, uh, uh, so in the UK, there is a basic income. There's unemployment benefits, there's nationalized health care. Uh, let's not go into that today. It's a whole other discussion. Oh, I like um, all of that. But, I'm not against but, any of that. <laughs> yeah. And I think what we need is some sort of social safety net for our data. There has to be some agreement around what we own and what we control and what we can say to the big companies and say um, the, uh, that as a society, this is the limit that we want to take Do up to. Do you think that's realistic, that that could happen? I don't think that could happen. Mm. I it's think a, it has tough. to the, the I wish it would. The Silicon Valley I wish it would. I capitalism. see no incentive for that to happen. What's their incentive? Yeah. I mean, it's it's not just like the companies doing it too, right? The problem is we need people on the governmental level who understand this stuff. And That's the not problem happening. is the brightest minds are going into these companies and right. they're doing stuff like Uber and they're trying to figure out there, how to. There is something happening though. I think you know? a lot of people watched Trump's election and said, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you don't have to have, you don't have to be a career politician. You don't have to have experience in public service. You don't have to have served. You could yep. still become president. And I guarantee you, Mark Zuckerberg. Oh yeah. And yeah. a lot oh, yeah, of other running. technocrats are looking he at this saying. He went to dinner with a family in Ohio. He's, he's running. Clearly you running know? and said, I yeah. could do a better job. I, why not me? And, and honestly, yeah. and I like, think yeah, that Zuckerberg now, just like Bill Gates, towards the end of his careers, uh -huh. became a philanthropist. Uh, I think Zuckerberg's got to having too much fun running Facebook right now, but I think he's definitely opening the door. And I think his retirement, and I don't think it's that far off, maybe mm -hmm. when he's in his forties, is public service because yeah, he's, I, I he's love a technocrat. That he set up the whole fund and stuff already like he is following in Bill Gates footsteps. We were talking mm -hmm. about the crazy thing billionaires and millionaires do earlier with their money and I don't think Bill Gates gets enough credit for like yeah, not look at that, being right? that, that big awesome? conspicuous spender yeah. and like mm -hmm. trying to help the world and educate kids and Well, he has so much so money good. he can do both. Exactly. Yeah. He can. But he you can have a, yeah, can have a submarine <laughs> and save the world. <laughs> you can. Yeah. yeah. You can. And yeah. maybe you can have yeah, it all. we should 
Yeah, but, but weirdly, yes, would, would, but, but, would, but the, here's he the question: Would a Mark Zuckerberg money. then do those? Things? Well, here's here's what it boils down to, and this is this is my thoughts on this: is it boils down to his constituents. Let's say he he does run for a for governor or president. His constituents have to demand that, and I really believe that the next generation of of kids they don't care. They they yeah. don't they don't that that's not going to be an important thing to them. A, 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 a they don't care about politics. Well, they don't care about or privacy. Privacy. I mean, privacy. to demand but, that from their representatives, right. no, they're not going to ask for that. Like, yeah, they're not going to ask for that because they're being conditioned by Zuckerberg too in his service. Exactly. So it's, exactly. It's all right. it's all like yeah, a big loop. Um, Can I just yeah? Mm -hmm. I just want to pull you up on something. Everybody talks about how great it is that Zuckerberg or Gates or some other billionaire is donating a few billion dollars to something or another. That's actually a pittance compared to what uh, governments donate. So the That's UK a very government, good point. Sure. Right? Pri it private charitable contributions are a pennies. fraction of what the government uh, That's right. So has. the UK government in 2015 spent $12.1 billion on overseas aid. That is one third of Bill, Bill Gates' total wealth. Right, and he is not spending what, that much. You're he a little out of date. Bill's worth eighty-seven billion now, but oh, wow. yeah. okay. <laughs> but the point yeah. remains is he's not yeah. spending twelve billion dollars a year on foreign aid. He's spending a couple of billion and having fun. He says he's going to give. He says he's going to give it all, all but a billion yeah. or two. And he's going to get some of Warren Buffett's, and he's got a bunch of other people right. donating it into a fund, which will probably hand out a couple of billion dollars a year. Now that's just the UK. The US government has a massive um, overseas aid budget and stuff like that. Don't lionize billionaires because no, they I gave agree. away some petty ch I petty agree. cash. I agree. To make themselves <laughs> feel good about all the money that they got. Every bit. year, that's the thing is, is yeah. yeah, Bill Gates is not giving away twelve billion dollars of his fortune a year, but that's also because he's not making eighty-seven billion dollars a year. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, this is a weird I, argument to be having because I think yeah. we can both <laughs> acknowledge that both. governments give away more. We need more both. Yeah. We need both. Yeah, we need both. It's There's clear an advantage there, Bill private Gates charitable contributions of, will never make up what we would lose if the government stopped doing sure. that. And, what, let's, and let's, let's, by the, the way, be very clear. It. When we say government, government is us. What we yes. do yeah. as a society with our tax dollars in aggregate is a lot more valuable than what a, a handful of super rich do. That's, of course, Meaningful. true. Yes. Yes. I'm not claiming that what he's not doing is not that what he's doing is not valuable. And in fact, he's doing very, very smart, um, bringing very good business ethics to how he spends that money. Whereas a lot of governments uh, do not uh, wisely give away aid money. I will absolutely agree with that. But let's not lionize how yes, much they right. give away because it's actually a pittance. No, I agree. But right? but. Eh, it's more about how they give it away. What too. do we like do? Things what do we do? So in. you you want this data yeah. safety net? Is that going to happen? Yeah. I think we have to iterate our way forward. We don't even know what that would look like. I mean, we mm -hmm. we haven't got to the end of the ma machine learning mm -hmm. uh, process. It's not going to know happen. how. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you. See, I mean, yeah. it also starts with smart people, smarter people in government and kind of in power who understand how the stuff and works. And that is like going to happen, machine. but it's going to be it's Mark built, Zuckerberg. Unless it's yeah. built in the way of a New Deal uh, esque mm -hmm. thing, where it is literally set up as a a government. Based, but but then I your would data propose, is international. Yes. Your data is global. So I how, would do you, how do you fix that? That if you really care about this, you're going to become a survivalist, a data survivalist, <laughs> and the rest yeah. of us are just going to go along with our lives, and uh, yeah. we don't know and what the fashion advice. Have yeah. you guys uh, seen or read The Circle? It is. It's not a very good book. It's a pretty terrible movie. But uh, like, the most <laughs> well, great. Thanks thing for the recommendation. Right, yeah, I can't, can't wait. Yeah, I'm buying it right now. Like one of the only like I think interesting ideas in it is the way we're handling our privacy and our data yeah. and how we're kind of just opening ourselves up. It's to Dave Edgar's novel, uh, which is kind of an amalgam of Google and Facebook. I felt like it was very yeah. Facebooky, but then there's some Googley stuff in it too. There, there's a lot of stuff. Like, the novel itself was kind of a mess, but that movie, guys, do not see that movie. Do I not it see it. It's that bad. It is terrible. It is so I, bad. I take um, it we'll be reviewing that on Slash Film sometime soon. We are. We're going to be doing that uh, oh. next week, week after this one. Mm -hmm. That's Devendra's great uh, film podcast. I yeah. sometimes wish I could just stop talking about technology and talk about culture, films, oh, you books, <laughs> no, music. That, if only you had that'll a be, network, That'll be Leo. the podcast we, we could start, start up, Leo. We'll start that one. <laughs> Maybe I'll just stop this technology stuff, <laughs> this end stage capitalism, movie reviews. and instead talk about the, you know, the fun stuff, you know, because mm. we should all be, you know, 
singing as the ship goes down. <laughs> in, in the future, we're yeah. all just going to be little MST3K silhouettes uh, making fun of pop culture and the news yeah. and everything. Like, yeah. That's, that's yeah. where we're headed. Yeah. Hey, you guys are great. Hey. I want to just keep going, but we really shouldn't because I know you're probably starving. Uh, I need to wait for Nad. Yeah. I got to go eat. <laughs> and it's kind of the middle of the night for Greg. I don't know how late it is. Two in the morning almost? Two in the morning, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for staying up late with us, Greg. It's always a pleasure. Ah, most fun you can have sitting down. I agree. Well, no, I wouldn't agree with that. But it's, <laughs> I love a good orange is the new black. But, by the way, you can see that now. All the first 10 episodes available on BitTorrent. Uh, thanks to the you, Dark Overlord. Yeah, Dark mm. Overlord is like, thanks to our sponsor, Netflix. <laughs> Good work, if you're Overlord. interested in getting the last three episodes, subscribe. It's only nine ninety nine a month. Ashley, what are you doing at CNET? Tell us some. Give us a plug. I just did a piece on the uh, DR1 has a micro series, and they do uh, micro drone racing inside uh, TV and movie sets. So they did <gasps> they rebuilt some of the sets from Firefly, and they oh, did some racing in there, and that was really nice. cool. Oh, that sounds uh, like fun. It was awesome, and and sort of the idea in this, and and something I really like is because drone racing is expensive and so um especially f you know fpv drone racing is really pricey and so they kind of want to bring uh, a, a pro racing series that uh you know kids or teenagers or you know adults who are like not really sure if they want to race they can sort of say hey like this isn't that expensive to get into yeah i'm gonna try it i'll try it out i'll see if i'm any good at this and so um i really like that they're doing this it's really neat and uh and of course like the backdrop could not be freaking cooler oh, how i got fun. to go onto the set and and it was just such a moment to be able to see a ship from the tv show firefly it was really cool one of my all-time favorite tv shows wouldn't that be fun I, so they kept the sets mm -hmm. around so they, I think they said they had, there was some rebuilding that had to be done, uh, but they are there. A couple of the set pieces were still there, so they kind of put everything together, re, you know, relit it up and and made it look cinematic, and uh, and they got some really great footage out of it. So oh, it, it was neat. really fun to be able to kind of go check that out. And they also did, um, I think they did with Josh Hutchinson and Sarah Wayne Callas. I forget what the name of the show is. Uh, Colony. They went to, they did some drone racing through that set too. So it's not just, you know, defunct television sets. They're also going to uh, to shows that are actually being produced, which is pretty neat. How fun is that? Yeah. Uh, CNET.com. Yeah. I'm also, I'm hosting a, a comic book show. You talk about hosting uh, pop culture stuff. I'm doing a comic book show now on Nerdist Alpha called Al uh, Alpha Comic Book Club, where we, it's like a book club, but with comic books. And it's really fun. So we do it every Monday now, night on. live. Ashley, did you read comic books when you were little? I didn't. I uh, I played video games yeah, when me I was too. little. My, my yeah. NES was my best friend. We didn't have video home. games, but I banged rocks together. It was really fun. <laughs> that was exciting, I'm yeah. sure. Played um, in the who's old, that old hoop and stick? <laughs> got the old hoop and stick, Leo? Yeah. Hoop and stick. Loved my hoop and <laughs> stick. Right. And that thing, um, the little cup where you try yeah. to get the ball in it, love that. Oh, that's a good one. Now is a good one. Now is a fun. Now is a fun. <laughs> but I, I'm like kind of the baby comic book reader out of the three of us. And uh, there's three hosts. It's Hector Navarro and Damien Poitier, which um, both longtime comic book readers. So they are excited to sort of see my perspective as a fresh reader to a lot of series. Nice. Um, tomorrow nice. we're talking about Sandman, which uh, <gasps> oh. is... Just read the first, you know, eight issues. I, I, I have. It's, it's so freaking good. I'm a nail game, and I'm a huge. I mean, I'm just the end of the. He's the greatest, but it's brilliant. I bought, and I love it. The leather bound collection oh, of Sandman. Mm. It's so good. It's four volumes. I just three started or four reading volumes. it. It's so good. It's so beautiful, and it, the illustrations oh of the God. writing and the story. It's just really great. And so we're talking about it. I'll save all the rest of it for the show tomorrow, but. Uh, it's on uh, Nerdist Alpha, so I get to do a little comic book show on the side, too. Uh, I always feel guilty when, because we have a lot of comic book fans, and I never, I wasn't a big, I had, you know, I read comic books as a kid, but I wasn't like a huge. You weren't a collector. I wasn't a I wasn't like into it. Sure. I sure. actually was like, I would get, you know, I'd go to the drugstore and I'd buy a 20 cent comic book and I'd read it and I'd throw it away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's it. That You know, that was my, <laughs> that was my interest in comic books. Uh, yeah. And Div Divindra Hardwar, he does Slash Film uh, and many other things, but of course he's senior editor in Gadget. Tell us about Slash Film. Give us a plug. Yeah. 
well, what we're doing now. I don't know. We, we review a movie every week at Slash Film um, for the Slash Film Cast podcast. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. A lot of good stuff coming up, too. Can't wait to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy 2, oh, which yeah. is very, very You good. survived the doldrums, you know, January, February, March, yeah. usually pretty bad for film. It was actually pretty, like, we had a good run for a while. It's better Colossal than usual. Was fantastic. Get usually, out. usually they bury really movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they bury movies in the first quarter, but there was some good stuff. Get Out? You liked Get Out? I didn't see that. I loved Get Out. And there's a lot of good TV starting up soon, too, right? Uh, Neil Gaiman's thing, uh, American God. Oh. American God. Oh. In a couple minutes. Oh, oh is it? Is yeah, it tonight? Oh, it's tonight. Tonight. bye, everybody. So, Thanks for joining us. There you us. go. <laughs> you Thank watch. you, Devendra. Take care. Hand go Hand watch Tales TV. On Hulu and stuff now. So there's just <laughs> nice. so much good stuff nice. to watch when we talk about Great all of that. I've been watching Handmaid's yeah. Tale. Wow, is that grim? <laughs> that is depressing. Jeez. Very dark. It is rough. Yeah. <sighs> Wow. Davindra does, uh, right. he does Slash Filmcast with uh, my old uh, Tomorrow Daily co-host, Jeff Kanata. Oh, ah. nice. Jeff's great. Yes, who, Jeff is great. I love just Jeff. just a delight. Isn't he yeah, sweet? He is a, just a good human through and through. <laughs> I, I uh, generally uh, loathe anybody who worked for G4, but he's okay. He's all right, guys. <laughs> I wrote for G4. Okay, like Ashley. Really you're, now makes two people all, all I can. And Karsten, you worked for G4? <laughs> oh, crap. I'm surrounded. Sorry, Leo. <laughs> it's over. Yeah, everybody. Devendra, you for work G4, for G4. Yeah. No. I wish I watched a lot. You of G4. wish. I oh. imagine living there or working there too. Oh. But uh, it's nice to be here, Leo. It's almost like uh, we're on Tech TV, yeah. recreating all your yeah. good Think stuff. Think of yeah. that. Uh. Think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Kicking it old school. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Give my regards to Jeff. Actually, I love Jeff. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We do Twit every uh, Sunday evening around 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC, late at night in the UK, but that's okay. Stay up late with us. You can watch live and join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. Can't be here live, though. Don't worry. Uh, we always, you know, really what we're doing here is making a podcast. It's on demand. All you have to do is go to twit.tv to get on-demand versions of all of our shows, audio and video. We do high-def video as well. And you can, uh, of course, subscribe, or, you know, stream it anywhere, but subscribe. Do subscribe. In fact, if you've got a favorite podcatcher, uh, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Podcast Republic, Stitcher, Slacker, TuneIn, whatever you use to subscribe, please subscribe because I don't think you want to miss an episode. This is something you should have just, you'll be glad some Monday you'll be, you'll be stuck in traffic and you'll go, oh, I've got a twit to listen to. So please do that for me, will you? Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Another twit. It's amazing. It's in the can. Bye-bye. Doing the twit. Doing the twit.